Oh, who, oh, who is Preston John? Welcome to the 96th installment of the Preston John investigation. We've been searching through the timelines, through the indigenous truth, through their records a first contact with the great Khan. We're looking at their maps, their cartography. I mean, it's been taking us places, right? Right to the land of Prester John. Any, uh, are we just talking or not? I mean, whether we're talking a non kingdom or any kingdom, is there a difference? British Museum, 1530s, and the 1530 map in the British Museum shows the Strait of Any. And in the East shows America, but it shows Preston John in the area where you all, Judah, would be. Don't get no clearer than that. We're just talking a map in 1530, right? This is a big deal, which makes this the, you know, primary investigation seeking the creator and David, your con, Hosea three is your primary investigation. Seeking the creator means you're keeping the code primary because they got the Presta on the map El Presta Juan did a black man <laughs> discover the fountain you I want to talk I want to talk fountain you know while we got this fire burning we're going to have to get into that mem sauce. And to get into that mem sauce, we're going to have to talk dragon, right? Because <laughs> the dragon represents the water, the power, the mem sauce. Yo, Seth, we out of here, man. Right? So, they know the press is right here in North America, so called, so called. <laughs> we know we're just talking Asia. This 1530 map in the British Museum shows Anya, Straits of Anya, later called the Bering Strait. And it gave us this story of the Indians crossing over the Bering Strait, almost like everything was in reverse. Everything we've been taught is in reverse. These Nagas was already over here. <laughs> they were setting up shop in the other Asia. Preston John is already in Utah, Utah, Judah. This is when we get on this Mormon drop, Moroni drop. And I get it, right? Two sticks, I get it. You got to utilize the babies in the bathwater that you're getting out the Book of Mormon and connect that with the so-called Old Testament or the the Tanakh, the Papu Va, the indigenous truth, and all praise the Wild. This is, you know, this has been our journey, man. Just go back and, you know, dig on our pedigree. <laughs> you know, we've been digging on, you know, the Papu Vu, the frame and the shape. We've been connecting the frequencies so that by the time we start talking about their frequencies, their spells and their necromancy, we can observe what they've taken from us and what they're using against us. They say, oh, to take down the dragon, we need to 
call on a dragon. We need to call on a primal dracon. We need to try to summon Leviathan. We need to try to summon, you know, some of the ancient dragons of creation. And hence the story in Christianity of the fallen angels, right? You got the ones that got their wings clipped. We're going to get on the first occurrence of a wing clipping just to know we ain't tripping in Preston John 96, talking back to the more and more war. And what necromancy, Simon Necromacawa, what necromancy is the mad Arab calling on? Seem to have a lot of dragon talk to it. They got to take our dragons down, you know what I'm saying? They got to take down the Preston because to take down the Preston is to take down the dragon. Eighteen twenty eight dictionary Preston is a dragon, a meteor, a comet, right? <laughs> now compare this to this comet of 1812, the Comsey flow and you know, the star of Bethlehem and their, you know, New Testament, JC's born a star of Bethlehem, which is a dragon, but they're getting it from the fact that this dragon is always present when these presses are born. The dragon's always present when the presta is born. And this is where they're getting the star, but we know we're talking star with a tail. We know we're talking presta. Prester is a meteor. Dragon is a meteor. <laughs> if the Prester is a meteor and the dragon's a meteor, then perhaps the Prester is the dragon. Just like Joshua is Kitsukoodle rainbow dragon these are the elements of you because a dragon is a fierce a violent person we're talking to kum say we're talking a violent noggin <laughs> male or female this man this woman is a dragon this man or woman is a dragon a dragon nah a preston media you know media media yeah Shooting meteor, fiery shooting meteor, drag. Preston. Don't get the Preston angry. <laughs> Might see that fire, this collision of fire, this violence, because the violence <laughs> is the dragon, a fierce or violent person. Man or woman is a dragon. Dragon, this is how they hijack it. The Preston. So the Preston, the dragon, is already in Judah, Utah. The Mormons, Baroni and them, they are all correlating with this indigenous truth that's guarded the secret knowledge, right? Preston John, a.k.a. Priest John, John the Patriarch of the Indians, Ethiopian, that goose. If we connect the dots and look at old maps, we see the Anion Kingdom. Now, when you do some investigating, Anion or Anion with an O-N or Arna, <laughs> Anion or Anion is Arna. If we tie that into Utah, Judah, we see the Arnon River, which is the Anion River, which is the Jordan River, <laughs> which goes into the Great Salt Lake because this Arnon is separating these tribes, these Amorites, these Moabites from the tribes of Israel, you know what I'm saying? So they're crossing this Arnon or they're crossing the Jordan or the Yardon, right? Because there ain't no J. 
Oh, man, we're catching them slipping. Which goes into the great salt sea or dead sea. We compared this last time as well. Get the drop. Oh, this is in Utah, Utah, Judah, right? Judah, the Preston. And in the old Spanish map from 1843, uh, or excuse me, 47, we see Utah, Judah was the ancient residence of the Aztecs. Aboriginal America, it's Moors and Hebrews, right? It's definitely a more and more war. And Utah, Judah was part of Preston John's Anion kingdom. Hey, shout out to folk three, two. Hey, shout out to you, my lady. More Aboriginal, you know what I'm saying? Because, hey, you know, we can build. We, we've been building. You know, I think we all see that this knowledge, y'all pray so wild, this fountain, this water springing up. It's a little different than the way they twisted it, even in the sciences, even in the science temples. They didn't quite present it like this before. This is Drop Nation. This is that Ruach. This is, this is that remnant. These are the cold keepers telling our story. They got to sit back in the back of our classroom, man. You know what I mean? We appreciate the AI, man. You know, we give you the AI, man. We're like, hey, let's keep building. Let's get out of each other's way and let's keep building, man. Because we can change things. Because it was a more and more war, don't mean it has to be a more and more war. You know what I'm saying? But if that's what it is behind the scenes, then y'all gonna have to make some choices who you're rocking with in terms of your energy, in terms of your frequency, in terms of your vibration. Because it can't be about this necromancy no more, man. This necro necromicon, man. You know, we've been getting into that. Man. We're gonna get back into it, but look, man. They calling all the dragons. All right, I'm just jumping into it, man. They're calling all chaos dragons. Let them curse it. That curse the day who are skillful to rouse Leviathan. This is what they're doing, man. Whether they're actually rousing the Leviathan or some other type of Leviathan. You know, Leviathan is a different, it's like a class of dragons, you know. It's a type of dragon. You know, you got the main Levi, you know, Hawaz dragon, and then you got other Leviathan type of dragons. But, you know, which ones are they calling on? What are they calling on? Huh? In the Necromicon. Worship of the ancient ones. I'm not playing, man. I'm not playing, man. We, we just get into the root. Love to the bro. Their necromancy is fallen dragon magic. You know what I'm saying? They are calling all fallen deities, fallen angels, fallen dracons. And, you know, we're going to get back to this, but I want to talk about the first fallen dracon, man. Because <laughs> by the time they call on the vibe, then it says S.H. Hook in his excellent Middle Eastern mythology tells us that the Leviathan mentioned in Job and elsewhere in the Old Testament is the Hebrew name given to the serpent Tiamat. So when they're worshiping Tiamat, it's the same flow now. Some would say that this is a feminine energy and Leviathan's a masculine energy. I don't know, I can't confirm or deny, but it seems like this is way, this is where they're pivoting, you know what I'm saying? This is where they're tapping in, overwhelmingly, you know what I mean? It reveals that there was an in existence, either a cult or scattered individuals who worshiped or called upon the serpent of the sea. You see, Hawa can create the great sea fish or the great Leviathan, <laughs> the whale. <laughs> These great dragons are not for you to turn to and start calling on and, and asking for help and all this stuff. Hawa said, I'm your savior. If you're going to get one of these dragons to help you, I'm going to send that dragon because I'm your savior, my not. When you start going off and doing this, this is why you fall and this is why they mad. 
This is why they mad. But we're just talking about the mad air, man. Can't make this up. The Moorish American community has taken a vested interest in the workings of the Necromicon. Right? This is what we're getting a grimoire or spell or magic book written by Peter Lavenda, aka Simon. But it's following this narration from who they're calling the Mad Arab, which is Noble Druali. Got you. And this, you know, they got into their elders and all that. Here's this Arnon River popping up, right? Just like, just like we say, right? I mean, basically it's all happening. <laughs> Cause we just talking Arnon. Which is the Anion. So this separation, you know, this R9 is happening right here in the great US of A. But we're just talking about Asia. They calling all of it, then man. <laughs> Serpents of the sea and abyss. However, indeed, the Hebrew word for abyss that is found in Genesis 1 and 2 is hook tells us to home which the majority of the scholars take to be a survival of the name of the chaos dragon tmi so they don't know it's just the majority of scholars take it to be the survival of the name tmi so maybe they're not calling on Leviathan. maybe they're just choosing to call on tmi okay chaos dragon and you know all this from chaos comes order business you know ain't that a part of their uh slogan from chaos comes order out of chaos <laughs> are they literally talking order out of chaos because they're worshiping who they would call the great mother tmi right so is this connecting to this hebrew um you know queen mother of heaven that was worshiped celestial mother we're not talking about your big mama, mama, mama. They're talking to you, you know what I'm saying? They're deifying entities, not the actual existence. They're not going to Hawaii. They're not going to the breath. They're not going to big mama. They're going to the dragon. Now, big mama can be a dragon, but big mama, you know, is not just in dragon form, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> You know what I mean? This is why we have no images, worshiping no images, because Hawa can be a butterfly. Hawa, a frame or shaper, could be a caterpillar, could be a, a lion, or it could be a rainbow dragon. You know what I'm saying? Hawa could be all of existence, because Hawa is existence. So you can't just put it in one type of way, in uh, one image, and say, this is the image of the creator, because that's Rule number one, you know what I'm saying? It's blasphemy, man. So this is the difference between us, but there's tapping in. They're trying to tap into us to one, figure out what the dragon truly is because it's still unknown to them. But, you know, they're getting a little, you know, bits and pieces at a time to put their magic and spells on us while we sleep. That's all. So it says this monster is well known to cult worship all over the world. In China, however, there is an interesting twist. Uh oh. Far from being considered a completely hostile creature dedicated to the erasure of mankind from the page of existence, the dragon is given a place of preeminence. And one does not hear of a Chinese angel or saint striving to slay the dragon. Whoa. <laughs> so that's just straight up hijack city. Who in their right mind would really try to slay the dragon? When you realize it's the center of everything you're talking about in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, the water, the earth, the fire, 
the ether, right? So how, why slay the ether? Why slay your own breath? Why slay the, your own earth? Why would you slay the dragon? But the Chinese rather wanted to cultivate it. The Chinese system of geomancy, right? We got this before feng shui is the science of understanding the dragon currents. Managa, they're talking dragon in their necromancy book because they have to tap into it. The currency, they have to cultivate it, but they really want to slay it. And remember the creations of opposites is what slays it. Even opposite dragons. Dragon currents, we're talking currency, frequency, man, frequency, which exists beneath the earth. These same telluric energies that are distilled in such places as Charles, Charles Tears Cathedral in France, Glastonbury Tor in England, and the ziggurats of Mesopotamia in both the European and Chinese cultures, the dragon or serpent, but we know we're talking dragon, is said to resemble somewhere, or excuse me, reside somewhere below the earth. It is a powerful force, a magical force. This is what they want to tap into, which is identified with the mastery over the creation of the world. It is also a power that can be summoned by the few and not the many. They're not talking about the creator. They're talking about the creation of the creator. However, in China, there did not seem to be a backlash or fear or resentment against this force as well as was known in Europe and Palestine. And the symbol of might and kingship in China is still the dragon. Then they connect that to the Kundalini and the rites of their evil magic or forbidden magic. It says, for the organ of Wilhelm, Wilhelm Reich is just as much Leviathan as the Kundalini of the Tantric Adepts and the power raised by the witches. So this witch power connects again <laughs> to Leviathan Manai. It has always, at least in the past 2000 years, been associated with occultism, essentially with rites of evil magic or forbidden magic of the enemy and of Satan, right? Right. Satan in the garden <laughs> and the twisting sacred spiral formed by the serpent of the caduceus and by the spinning of the galaxies and also the same Leviathan as the spiral. Leviathan as the spiral of the biologist code of life, DNA. So at the heart of it, you got the dragon spiral is your DNA. And again, they're just tapping into it. And, you know, later they call this thing something like KUR or something like that. I'm going to bounce around this joint, but, you know, just so you know, it ain't no play play. You know, this is, I'm just bouncing around in there. These are their incantations, you know what I'm saying? This is a, you know, a description of one, you know, referring to this Leviathan. All right, so it says, note the original translator had noted the resemblance between the Greek word for Lord's Koryos and the Sumerian word for mountain or cur, and for a type of underworld clethoic monster, which is also called cur and which refers to the Leviathan of the Old Testament. So this is happening during their incantations. And, you know, I don't suggest you play with this because they're calling all, you know, energies, man, from the beginning, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, you don't know what, you know, where, what pathway, you know what I'm saying, is which, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, we got our own magic that we are... <laughs> coding up within us and that energy of code keeping is way more powerful than all this little play play. This is all play play. Connecting KTC directly to the creator 
It's way more powerful than trying to summon an old dragon, <laughs> an old fallen one. Because I don't even think they, I don't think they have access to Hawaz Leviathan, even in the sacred text, it, you know, talks about a sacrifice that was made and that Leviathan is the manna, you know what I'm saying, uh, that was rained down on the children of Hasharah. You know what I mean? But he's talking about that manna flow. You know what I mean? Just, just so we know it ain't play play. What's that? Psalm 70, Psalm 73 or 75. Might be 74. I like 73 though. Okay. So again, we're talking Leviathan. Talking Leviathan. Verse 12, Psalm 74. Yet Hawah is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou did break the sea in pieces by your strength. Thou did shatter the heads of the sea monsters in the water, so certain dragons were shattered or were fallen or, you know, stripped of their wings. Not all dragons chose up. Not all angels chose up. Not all people choose up. Thou did crush the heads of Leviathan. Now, it's letting you know Leviathan got many heads, but specifically not because Leviathan was an evil dragon, but Leviathan was sacrificed Thou gave him to be food. Oh, okay. We don't read Psalm 70, 74 now. Some Nagas just don't read enough at all. But Leviathan was sacrificed for the righteous. A while gave him to be food to the Nagas inhabiting the wilderness, man. So when they got that manna, <laughs> that's literally, you know, high frequency, high electricity, you know what I'm saying? Leviathan flow, you know what I mean? So, hey, let's not front a Leviathan who was food. This says for the folk inhabiting the wilderness. We know we're talking about the righteous. And you look on some other translations, it's going to take you right to the pious or the righteous. But they don't, you know, they don't want you to draw these connections that while you are in the wilderness, you, for survival, are eating Leviathan. Now, I want you to, I want to bring this into what they're doing, you know what I'm saying, what their magic is and the fact that you already got it. A lot of what they're doing is twisted off of what has already been established you know what i'm saying so you know them trying to feed off the dragon is literally a take of us literally feeding off the dragon them wanting to feed off leviathan leviathan is already food to the righteous This is the KJV version. Uh, they break the heads of Leviathan and gave him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Thou did cleave the fountain and the flood. We're going to talk a little fountain. <laughs> did a black man discover the fountain? Thou dries up mighty rivers, man, like the Arna, <laughs> like the Sambanya. Yeah, we're just talking Leviathan, man. We're just digging on some other translations that they got.
<laughs> this one said you gave him to be food for the creatures of the wilderness. Wow. So we got creatures. We got inhabitants. We got people. <laughs> I'm just saying all the different names that they uh you know ran away from instead of just calling them a wise people, you know, the righteous. Wow. <laughs> and you set it as food for desert creatures. Desert creatures. Now, <laughs> we just got people. We got inhabitants. We got people. I'm just showing you what they've gone to so that when you say, how come I never saw that before or really understood, you know what I'm saying, the magic going on here. This is why. Look at these translations. You wouldn't. You reading this food for desert creatures, you don't think that applies to you or righteous nagas? Food to the people. It don't, it don't say desert creatures no more. Psalm 74, food to the righteous. In the wilderness. <laughs> Let me see if we can stumble on a better translation here, man. Yeah. Let's go with pious. I mean, trust me, watch this, man. Just watch this. Remember, they said creatures of the wilderness, man. Gave him his food for the wild beast. Wow. <laughs> oh yeah, Levi, you know, comes with a lot of <laughs> a lot of frequency they say one stare from levi man will burn you down man can you draw a hook and put it in the vibe then we got to see why the vibe then it's just so popular man you know why do they got to tap into this frequency why they got to tap into this frequency man
I love catching them slipping. Food for the desert creatures. Creatures of the desert. I mean, this doesn't even sound like they're even talking about people no more. <laughs> Look at this translation. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You fed him to the people who live along the coast. They ain't even talking about wilderness no more. So some switched the wilderness to desert. Some, you know, switched the people to creatures. Now it's people that live along the coast, get fed Leviathan. <laughs> you know, uh, you think Hawaii's feeding a hijack Leviathan or his people? Uh, try to catch him slipping because <laughs> I know I saw a translation that had righteous in it, either righteous or pious or something like that. Uh, hey, meantime, we're coming up on some great links though. It says, according to the tradition, you get it bigger. Well, you know, this is called uh, The Meaning and Significance of Leviathan by Rabbi Ken Stolen. Right. A creature of immense supernatural proportions, which Klein Dictionary identifies as a serpent, dragon, or whale. See how they always switch dragon and whale like Moby Dick, man? Ah, sometimes the Leviathan appears on its own and sometimes together, often in battle with another creature, with other creatures such as the Behemoth. Now my noggin. I don't know if you see what I see, but when they say Behemoth, I remember thinking about this before, kind of remind me of the BMI or, you know, Baphomet. You know, and some would call Baphomet or Behemoth a Tiamat type of flow to the, you know, like a male female type of flow. Um, you know, okay. Or Ziz, they say large bird, okay, but, hmm. You know, this creature's at war with Leviathan, you know, in the sacred text they had. Both of them pretty much slaying each other. 
You know, if, if Leviathan gets eaten, does Beard Ma get eaten too? Let's go. Man, I appreciate y'all for bearing with me, man. I'm just, you know, got into a wild goose chase, man, looking at <laughs> this Leviathan flow. Perhaps even the skinning of the Leviathan at the end of days, which was, which we previously argued, seemed to be a proof of Leviathan's inherent goodness and holiness, and that his skin was being used for a mitzvah. <coughs> All right, so <coughs> I'll clear my throat, man. Mitzvah, man. <coughs> mitzvah. It right, needs to be revisited since there, too. The end, it's violent. All right. We had a theory before about Leviathan skin being stretched like a firmament, and that maybe the firmament is Leviathan scales. You know what I'm saying? Um, you know, different texts talk about the skin being spread out like a canopy for the righteous so everything about leviathan is being used for the righteous is the point i'm making and um you know there is some translations that refer to the righteous rather than some uh desert people or you know some creatures of the desert you know that type of thing leviathan was used as a righteous sacrifice it's funny how their New Testament has their own sacrifice, right? But Leviathan was sacrificed literally as food. Skin spread like a canopy for the righteous, like a firmament for the righteous. I just want to see why they're calling on this energy or a type of Leviathan energy. Surely, if the Leviathan were not a holy creature, it would not qualify for such use. We're talking about the second Masor mentioned in the Gomorrah has to do with the skin of the Leviathan, which is clearly associated with a mitzvah making a sukkah. And again, a reward for the righteous in the end of days. So we're just using our own cognitive reasoning, man, that Leviathan is not being used to feed no hijack, to feed no creatures of the desert. It's being used to feed the tribe in the wilderness like we keep getting. They keep saying wilderness, and then they'll use a the word like people, people in the wilderness, creature in the wilderness, you know, creatures and all that stuff. But they talking about the righteous, man. Because Leviathan wouldn't be used for no other purpose, wouldn't be sacrificed for no other purpose. The first Masora that the Gomorrah cites is that the Leviathan, along with the Shor Habor, will be served up as food for the righteous in the end of days. Body bag. <laughs> All right, so we're not tripping when we start reading this and they keep talking about uh creatures <laughs> they're hiding the fact that this is happening with the righteous manaya that this is a righteous sacrifice for the righteous in the desert for the righteous in the wilderness okay that's all we needed to know
So what power? Specifically, you know, is this Kerr the same as Leviathan like they saying, or is it more of a TMI flow? We don't know, we don't know. But it seems to all begin, you know, with this Leviathan. <laughs> and even before that, you know, this dragon that is falling, whether they're talking TMI, you know, specifically, you know, all this comes back down to Genesis 3. So we got that fire burning for the tribe, tribe. And I got Genesis 3 up, man. Let's get cozy. Pressed to 96. And, you know, we're digging on it. We're getting clarity, man. We're taking our time. You know, why would they keep saying creatures? Why would they just call you people instead of Israel when you're in the desert? You know, I think that's a good place to start. Let me just pull up this Psalms uh, 74 over here, transition that into Genesis 3, and then we, and then we blasting off, man. <laughs> we blasting off, man. We got so much to talk about. So, hey, hi, my nagas. Hey, we surfing away. That what die, drop nation. Let's get it. Psalms 74. Just looking... Listen to the context of this Psalms and think about who's in the wilderness <laughs> that's being fed by a what? Do you know any stories about any hijacks gathering in the wilderness and being fed by the creator? So why in the hell will they call them creatures in the desert instead of righteous in the wilderness when it comes to Leviathan? It seems that it's hinting at their magic. at least the magic that they're tapping into. You know, for us to eat this, you know, electricity of this great dragon, right? That this great dragon was prepared from the beginning as a meal. And that certain uh, sacred texts love to Aqua Larissa show that there was a female at first and, you know, she too was sacrificed. for food to protect the righteous with a canopy which could be a firmament of this great dragon. Psalms 74. Why, O Hawah, hast thou cast us off forever? Why does your anger smoke against the flock of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you, which thou has gotten of old, which thou has redeemed to be the tribe of your inheritance. And Mount Zion, where you have dwelt, lift up your steps because of the perpetual ruins, even all the evil that the enemy has done in the sanctuary, your adversaries have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their own signs for signs. It seemed as when men willed upwards, axes in a thicket of trees, and now all the carved work thereof together, they strike down with hatcheted hammers, they have set your sanctuary on fire. They are profane the dwelling place of your name, even to the ground. They said in their heart, let us make havoc of them all together. Just like let us cut them off, right, from being a nation. They said in their heart, let us make havoc, let us make chaos of them all together. They have burned up all the meeting places of Hawa in the land. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet. What does it sound like, Managa Hosea 3? Many days, solitary, many days without a con, without your priestly things, right? No sign 
verse 9. We see not our signs. There is no more any prophet, neither is there among us any that knows how long. We used to know how long, how much longer we had to endure. We used to have those, you know, prophets, those, those powerful nagas that can tap in to the creator directly. How long? Sound like that address flow, right? <laughs> how long shall we endure? How long, O Hawa, shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme your name forever? Ain't that how we feeling now? Hawa, you gonna let them just pop off forever? Why withdraw us you your hand, even your right hand, draw it out of your bosom and consume them? So we, we're reading Psalm 74. I want to know who's inhabiting the wilderness. The creatures of the desert. Like we just read in all these translations, that's why I took my time with it. Because <laughs> I want you to see how absolutely absurd it is for them to call the righteous in the wilderness creatures in the desert. That's a slap in the face, like, Genesis 9, when they switched it to, instead of old lion, who will rouse up this old lion? It says, who will rouse up uh, uh, this, this, this like female lion or lioness? Who will rouse this lioness? How you change it to lioness? How does it go to the new international version? Now it's lioness, but it started out as being an old lion. It's just a slap in the face to call us creatures in the desert. When you know you're talking about the righteous, but you don't want to connect that to this Leviathan food <laughs> and whatever they're tapping into, whether it's this or that, it seems to be a duplicate of what was already in you. This frequency that was this Leviathan sacrifice was only for the righteous in the wilderness. It's the manna that's being rained down in the wilderness. We're talking about a canopy of Leviathan raining down manna. Leviathan ain't some, you know, uh, you know, random fish in the sea. You know what I'm saying? This is super high frequency. You know what I'm saying? Super high frequency. So did Hawa create Leviathan as meat or as food for this purpose, for this protection, as a canopy for this protection? What was the purpose of these big old fish, <laughs> big sea fish, right? So let's get it. Hawa, raise your right hand, don't withdraw it. Consume our enemies, draw it out of your bosom. Consume them, verse 12. Yet Hawa is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You did break the sea in pieces by your strength. You did shatter the heads of the sea, ma sea monsters in the waters. You did crush the heads of Leviathan. Another duplication of this, or in this re revelation talk in the New Testament is this multi-headed dragon that's supposed to be getting slayed. But this dragon is trying to consume the child, but the child is not a righteous child. This is a child of Jupiter. or is Jupiter. <laughs> so they flipped the dragon to be some 
devil killing the Zeus child. <laughs> but in reality, the dragon was doing what he was supposed to do, slaying all hijacks. They're infatuated with slaying the dragon. And we got it before an alchemy to slay the alchemical dragon. You must create the Cadmus, the opposites, the Conientio. They have to slay the dragon to slay you. Thou did crush the heads of Leviathan. Thou gave him to be food to the folk <laughs> inhabiting the wilderness. Who's these folk inhabiting the wilderness? Thou did cleave fountain and brook. Thou driest up ever flowing rivers. Thine is the day, thine also the night. Awah, oh, thou hast established luminary and sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. All the borders, my night. Thou hast made summer and winter. Remember this, how the enemy has reproached Hawa and how a base people have blasph blasphemed your name, blasphemed your name. Deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove unto the wild beast. Forget not the life of your poor forever. Look upon the covenant. We got that Psalms 89 last time. We'll get a piece again to remember who the covenant is with. For the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. Oh, let not the oppressed turn back in confusion. Let the poor and needy praise your name. So the same, you know, oppressed, the same, you know, seed of Israel that's being oppressed, that's being made poor, made needy. It's the same Nagas that they talking about inhabiting the wilderness, the folk or the creatures <laughs> inhabiting the wilderness. You don't see no part of this context where Hawaii is feeding a bunch of hijacks. Dawi is letting it know, like, you've done all this. You established the luminaries. You crushed the heads of Leviathan for what? To give him to be food for the Nagas in the wilderness, man. You cleave, you did cleave fountain and brook. So let's get on this fountain. Let's talk about the ever flowing waters. The Anya. That Oronaco flow. Look upon the covenant. Verse 21. Let not the oppressed turn back in confusion. Let the poor and needy praise your name. Arise, Hawa. Plead your own cause. Remember your reproach all the day. At the hand of the base man, forget not the voice of your adversaries. The tumult of those that rise up against you, which ascendeth continually to this day, my naga, to this day. Psalm 74 is all about the righteous and redemption. So when it talks about the nagas in the wilderness with Leviathan, Food. They learn to tap in from somebody. They learn what Leviathan manna. Remember, these Nagas was eating all manna all the time. In the wilderness. And raining down manna. Manna, manna, mo manna. <laughs> Banana fat. So just imagine, you know what I'm saying, the frequency and, you know, other nations are observing, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, this is old, you know, old connectivity. You know, I don't think they're tapping into this manner, but I think they're trying to tap in in the same manner, you know what I'm saying, to whatever energy, same as them 
uh, and Presta John and the Gypsies, these uh, Moors, these these Ethiopians in Western Europe, it said, are eating the dragon. They got spells to get them. They got incantations to to get the dragon out, to eat the dragon. Remember all that? <laughs> Might have to get that again. So they're eating the dragon against accidents of old age. They're getting younger. They're getting stronger. The dragon is the man or woman, <laughs> fierce or violent, towards the hijacking at the end of the day. This is why they're tapping into you, because you are the dragon. Violent man or woman, right? So now the first fallen dragon is described right here in Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Hawah had made, and he said unto the woman. So the, the dragon, right? So when they say serpent, let's just use dragon. It's going to make way more sense, my nigga. We popping off. Wow, now the dragon, the dragon was more wise than any beast of the field of Wame. Huh? <laughs> Make it way more sense now. So this dragon frequency had way more knowledge, way more wisdom than any other animal, beast, whatever you want to call it, of the field. And he said to the woman, <laughs> Yea, hath Hawah said, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, Oh, the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, Hawah has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the dragon said unto the woman, you shall not surely die, for Hawah does know that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as Hawah, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. <laughs> she took of the fruit. Now this kind of reminds me of the dragon fruit, man. <laughs> but let's go. We got a pomegranate flow as well, but uh huh. And did eat. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves girdles, and they heard the voice of Hawa walking in the garden towards the cool of the day. <laughs> and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of Hawa among the trees of the garden. And Hawa called unto the man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you you were naked? <laughs> and has thou eaten of the tree wherever I commanded that you should not eat? And they tried to spin this and say, oh, well, wh why not? You don't want it, you know, the, the devil, right? Or the dragon or the serpent <laughs> tried to spin it. Oh, man, you know, why? Why wouldn't he want you to eat this good fruit so that you'll be just like him, right? <laughs> you'll be just like God. That's like a child, you know, um, a seven, eight-year-old child saying, how come I can't leave the house whenever I want to? You don't want me to be like you and see the things you see and experience the life you live. A parent knows 
the stumbling blocks. You know, everything's in is in due time. You know, you can't get it too early. It wasn't their time to eat the tree. It wasn't their time to see all that they, you know, were made to see. You know, it wasn't that the order wasn't, you know what I'm saying? The serpent likes to twist it as, oh, well, God, the creator, just wants to hold back knowledge. That's like a friend of that seven-year-old saying, yeah, your parents just don't want you to grow up. So they should let you leave the house and go wherever you want to, whenever you want to, with whoever they want to. And you're like, nah, I just need to raise them. <laughs> so they have the filters and the knowledge, you know, necessary to be in those situations. You can't eat the tree out of order. You can't get certain knowledge out of order. You have to be prepared. Your vessel has to be prepared for this knowledge for this presence verse 12 and the man said the woman whom you gave to me she gave me the tree and i did eat <laughs> and why said to the woman what is this you've done and the woman said the serpent did it man <laughs> he beguiled me and i ate and a wise said to the serpent listen up a wise said to the dragon because thou has done this, cursed are you from among all cattle or all beasts of the field. Upon your belly shall you go. So as much as you hear about Leviathan being sacrificed in Psalm 74, his head broken, his, his head's broken, served as food or meat to the children in the wilderness, not the creatures. Here's another dragon, you know what I'm saying, that is cursed, but not in the way that Leviathan is. You know, he's a righteous sacrifice. This dragon here is literally cursed, has to go on his belly. Dust shall you eat all the days of your life. This is the formation of the alchemical serpent where a dragon stops flying and a snake begins to slither. We're just talking about the house slithering. We got on the house slithering. That's uh, Salvador, you know, connection to these Moorish houses. The Harry Potter flow. Yeah, the Harry Potter flow. House slithering. This is when it's began this is when it popped off from a dragon to a slithering snake an alchemical serpent impersonal in nature because this dragon this serpent had to be doing something other than crawling what do you think this dragon was doing before it was cursed Cursed to be on his belly. Cursed are you from among all beasts. Upon your belly you shall go. So it's physical. It's also metaphysical. You know what I'm saying? It's all thing. They're going to be a base frequency. They can't fly. They, they can't reach the ether. They can't see you. That's why you unknown. That's why the dragons of unknown origin, they can't see a night. They're too busy slithering. They can't eat the rub to this day. You got, you know, people like this. They, they just set traps for themselves. They're constantly at the lowest vibration, constantly trying to hustle, trying to hustle something on their own knockers. Too busy doing that to even, you know, learn how to fly. Too busy setting traps for a knock. Signing treaties on knockers. Greedy. Getting greedy on a knock. <laughs> Trying to take the inheritance. Trying to take away the inheritance forever. 
this beast, this serpent must have been doing something other than crawling for it to be cursed to be on his belly. Huh? What was it? Was it a walking serpent? Was it a hopping serpent? Or was it a fiery flying dragon that lost his wings? Point is, not all dragons are good. Not all dragons are bad. Not all angels are good. Not all angel frequencies are bad. It's a more and more war, my nag. It's a frequency war. It's a great on great war. But we already won. So whatever they call it on, you know, it's connected to something that's slithering, not something that's flying. You see what I'm saying? And this Leviathan flow they trying to tap into could only get them so far because they can't control it because they're out of order. And that's why I said only a few get to really tap into it. But whatever they're tapping into feels like they're getting it right from the handbook, the rule book of our own flow, of our own frequency. They just hijack city, man. I mean, we're going to keep our fire burning, but just know that when we talk about them, man, <laughs> you're talking about chemical serpents. This Leviathan flow they're tapping into, can't touch us because we already been fed off the frequency, fed off the energy. They're tapping into something that will create an opposite reaction from us. <laughs> They're calling on this stuff, these dragons, man. And <laughs> they can't control it. <clears throat> it says, there are no effective banishings for the forces invoked in the Necron Necromicon. They, there's no effective way to banish whatever they're conjuring up. Just keep this shit in mind. <laughs> keep it all in mind. Western occult history, the deities and demons identified within have probably not been effectively summoned in nearly 6,000 years. Ordinary exorcisms, baptism, form or banishing formulas have thus far proved extremely inadequate. This by experienced magicians, man. <laughs> so they can't get it. You know, they're, they're trying to use everything. It says you got to counter it with some type of uh, solar formula because a lot of their Sumerian magic is lunar oriented and some solar formula <laughs> might be presented in uh, the Jewish faith, you know, <laughs> might be presented even in the Lord's prayer <laughs> in the New Test. All magic all magic, man. The book of thought. Well, I'll be. Thought they never too far away <laughs> when it comes to the alchemical serpent. And we talked about the mad air, man, you know, so. They call him their prophet. So they claim some type of variant of Enuma Elish, Babylonian creature, myth. It's all about Babylon, the Babylonian creation epic. They're talking Tiamat, they're talking chaos, they're talking their ancient ones. The main theme of the book is the struggle between good and evil, principal forces of good are the elder gods and those of evil 
the action was. Well, you know, I can't confirm or deny any of them. <laughs> it relates how Marduk, leader of the Elder Gods, slew Tiamat. So they're still slaying the dragon, even in this epic, man. Queen of the ancient ones. So she was slew. And now they get to call and summon this frequency. Clove her body in two, created the heaven and earth from the two halves. Similar to Leviathan <laughs> being, you know, sacrificed and a part of his body being used for the firmament, right? So, okay. The elder gods also created mankind from the blood of Kingu. Other ancient ones are imprisoned beneath the earth or beyond the heavens or in another world beyond the pole. With the exception of the term elder and ancient ones, which were first popularized by Lovecraft. Ain't that a TV show on Netflix about black magic? <laughs> Many of these stories are derived from ancient myths, man. Simon's introduction claims that Lovecraft's mythos tales of the struggle between good and evil as personified by the good elder gods, right? And the evil great old ones. So all these connect to dragons man all right lovecraft work lovecraft's work did not feature such a conflict however the theme of cosmic war derives instead from the apocryphal book of enoch cites by cited by lovecraft in his essay supernatural horror and literature and later contributions to the cut hula who mythos by author august derla all right, they spell it C T H U L H U. All right, so these are their powers, man. Try not to even invoke their names, man, but you know, you could look into it, man. You could look into it. Yeah, we're talking black magic, man. We're talking murder, <laughs> which means you know we're talking more. Let's go. So, according to the testimony of Noble Ju Ali, the mad air, this is the testimony of all I've seen and all I've learned in those years that I have possessed the three seals of my shoe. I have seen 1,001 moons, and surely this is enough for the span of a man's life. Though it is said the prophets live much longer i am weak and ill and bear a great tiredness and ex exhaustion and a sigh hangs in my breast like a dark lantern i am old so he's saying he live a thousand and one moons now is that years or is that days or is that months <laughs> the wolves carry my name in their midnight speeches and that quiet subtle voice is summoning me from afar and a voice much closer will shout into my ear with unholy impatience the weight of my soul will decide his final resting place so he's going through it just jumping ahead a little bit man you, you know talking a lot of wing wang but here's that murder thing again that 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 more do right the more the more the more right He's talking about the places he done been, things he done seen. For this is the book of the dead, the book of the black earth that I have written down at the peril of my life exactly as I received it of the plains of what they call I-G-I-G-I, -I -I, I, the cruel celestial spirits from beyond the wanderers of the waste let all who read this book be warned thereby all right here's a warning listen up that the habitation of men are seen and surveyed by the ancient race of gods and demons from a time before time and they that seek revenge for that forgotten battle that took place somewhere in the cosmos and rent the worlds in the days before the creations of man when the elder gods walked 
the space is the race Marduk, all right, as he is known to the Chaldeans, and we already know about this Enki, our master, the Lord of the Magicians. All right, so they rocking with the Sumerian flow heavy, my knife. All right, the Babylonian flow heavy. All right, they're calling the elder gods the races of their M A R D U K, right? Now, what did they call the elder gods before? Before, they just said that the elders were uh, the Moorish Science Temple. <laughs> so let's put this, to, you know, we got to figure that shit out, man. So. The requisite knowledge spoken of is more science. How could it be otherwise when the text is narrated by the mad Arab? Before we go any further, I must say that for those not educated in the modern mechanics of more science, the movement is divided into two sections. Here's the two sections of which the Simon Necromicon may be the bridge. First, we may, so this is how it comes together. This is how you bridge both sections of more science okay you got the noble jew ali mad arab flow registered members of the more science table of america bang they're called the elder gods now whether they're just taking the titles or those behind that veil literally are linking up with this murduk flow and you know all this sumerian situation we're reading about but they are behind they're the section, okay, there's two sections. They are the section that's behind the more science temple as we know it today. Come, come. Treaties, treaties, man, treaties, I got it. Lots of treaties. So they would call themselves the elder gods. They are law-abiding citizens of the United States. Stop it, they, they just keep treaties, okay only seeking to expand on their knowledge of self and advance their community. So sounds good. Secondly, we have Moors. So the Moorish are not the Moors. All right, that's another section. Stay up in your section. <laughs> Secondly, we have the Moors who are inspired by the works of Charles Mosley Bay, as he is popularly known, developed the Masonic lineage that such organizations like Clock of Dynasty, the Great Seal of National Moorish Science and Fear. All right. Now it just says develop the Masonic lineage that such organizations, what? <laughs> it leaves you hanging. Now his students claim that they are not under the jurisdiction by treaty of the United States Society. All right. Then there's a third part of surrounding this hippie movement, but they're called the Moorish Orthodox Church, which reminds us of the Moorish Catholics, Moroccan Catholics. Oh, yeah, it gets deep. Simon Nakamakan leads the true Moorish scientists into what is known in some schools of thought a secret order of jinn inspired mechanics. And this jinn connects to the dragon flow, right? According to Clock of Dynasty, volumes two and three, authored by C. M. Bay, the heart of more science finds itself as mathematic, the science of geometry, the 12 signs of the zodiac, the turn the chromicon possesses the same geometric or geometric value of Master Mason. Hence, this Masonic lineage connected with those called the ancient ones. So from what we can gather, love to Warlock, uh, Asylum, internationalnews.com. Uh, the ancient ones connect primarily with the Masonic lineage, perhaps, you know what I'm saying? And the elder gods connect primarily within the Moore Science Temple of America specifically. But those calling themselves Moors or ancient ones, you know, subscribe more to the CM Bay flow. 
and more to the Masonic flow, which is the Necromicon. Con. <laughs> Con. I, mean, I think we're starting to see clearly. Many incantations and seals are described. So all we needed to know is that y'all got a real life spell book. Y'all got a real life spell book. And y'all still are expressing all this interest in it. Y'all got a real life spell book and y'all are expressing vested interest in the workings of the spell book. Okay, what kind of spells? Magic rituals, conjurations. They've been trying to curse Israel for a long time. Most of these are intended to ward off evil or to invoke the elder gods, the Masonic God. That's the Masonic lineage, right? Elder gods to one's aid. They're not calling on Hawa. They're trying to invoke these ancient powers. How's it got to do with Tim? What's it got to do with the dragon? Levi in them. Some of them are curses to be used against one's enemy. Body bad. Some of these <laughs> warding off evil, they, they will call you evil. Moab will call Israel evil, right? <laughs> you would be the enemies that, that's being cursed, right? <laughs> Live in full effect. The incantations are written in a mixture of English and more ancient languages with a few possible misspellings in the Roman romanization, romanization of the archaic words. There are also several words that do not appear to be from any known language. The many magical seals in the book pertain to particular gods and demons. Or we're talking dragons, fallen dragons, and are used when invoking or summoning the entity with which each is associated. In some cases, there are specific instructions on how to inscribe the seals and amulets, including the materials that should be used in the time of day for their creation. In other cases, only the seal itself is given. For some rituals, the book mentions that sacrifices should be altered. Uh-oh, listen up. One ritual in particular describes a human sacrifice of 11 men needed to enchant a knife that can summon TMI. I can't make this stuff up. Man. No, I can't make this shit up. Man. Can't make it up. So we got it out in the Necromicon that they summoning TMI, Leviathan, all that. We getting it, you know, just digging on this Wikipedia flow that they got a ritual that they need a human sacrifice of 11 Nagas. Now, if they got a ritual for 11 Nagas, you don't think they got a ritual for a thousand Nagas? What would a thousand Nagas get you? Look at this music industry, everybody coming up, missing all these places, all this human sacrifice, adrenochrome, right? All this stuff happening in places we can't see. Trafficking, all this stuff, right? For what? For their sacrifices. All their holy days, their pagan days, all connect to these sacrifices so that they can summon Dragons, my nugget. Not your dragon. <laughs> Primordial, right? Primordial dragons that <laughs> you're talking about a power that's not even meant to be played with.
by cursing us, they curse themselves. And this is what they haven't re- they haven't really recognized and realized. Maybe till this, maybe now they're getting it. You cursing Judah, you curse yourself. You curse the Presta, you curse yourself. You curse Hasharah, you cursing yourself. So they need to get a knife to summon TMI. Both the instruction in the book's marketing makes sensational claims for the book's magical power. The black blurb claims it is the most potent and potentially the most dangerous black book known to the Western world and that its rituals will bring beings and monsters into physical appearance. The book's introduction gives readers frequent warnings that the powers it contains are potentially life-threatening. And that perfect mental health is needed. (laughs) But do you think these fools doing this stuff today got perfect mental health? No, they just as crazy as everybody, right? So otherwise, the book is extremely dangerous. It claims a curse afflicted those who helped publish the book It also claims that the golden dawn methods of magical banishing will not work on the entities of this book. Wow. It's the golden dawn, uh, hermetic order. Hermes, Thoth, Trigmagestes, even Thoth can't tame these dragons. Even Thoth can't tame these dragons, which is why Thoth in the Emerald Tablets is moving around and you know, uh, circular patterns with little known angles to run away from the dragons protecting the barrier to get back to his carnation, not to get caught up by these dragons or else he'll be banished for cycles and cycles and cycles. He can't control these hounds of the barrier. He can't control these dragons. (laughs) Hermetics is no good for this. Golden Dawn, It's no good for this. Will not work on the entities of this book. So what's going on with the mad era, man? We just asking a few questions so we can really see, you know, what power Genghis Khan was dealing, you know, uh, coming in. You know what I'm saying? What, What power are they coming in? You can't talk Presta without talking dragon, power, magic. We're about to talk Shambhala and the Shintamani stone. But before we talk our magic, I just had to, you know, preface this Presta 96, digging on their magic, digging on what they're tapping into, possibly Leviathan, possibly TMI, whatever else they want to call it. This is why they get quiet when we start talking dragon, because we're coming with the pure water, because we're keeping the cold. Our magic is stronger than their magic. This is what they do know. It's coming from a pure water source. This mad Arab is going crazy. (laughs) He's going cray cray. He's saying, man, I, I done been to all these places. I descended into the foul places of death, eternal thirst. Reached the gate of Ganzir. No, too, I've spoken with all manner of spirits and demons. Those whose names are no longer in the societies of men or were never known. And the seals of some of these written herein. Yet others I may take with me when I leave you. <laughs> okay, I can't share those. I have seen the unknown lands that no map has ever chartered my nine. Uh oh. Mad air. Mad air. What you talking about, Noble? And again, you know, they're calling Noble Joy Ali the Mad Air, not me. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Is this an incarnation? Dude said he was a thousand years old. <laughs> and did he did he reincarnate in his body? You know, I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> But he say he done been to the unknown lands. 
Is that worlds beyond the poles where no map has ever chartered my night? I have lived in the deserts and the wasteland, spoken with demons and souls of slaughtered men and the women who have died in childbirth, victims of the she fiend, oh, another, another name. I have traveled beneath the seas in search of the palace of our master. And uh, he's looking for Thoth, man. He's looking for Thoth. And found the stone of monuments and vanquished civilizations and deciphered the writings of some of these, while still others remain mysteries to any man who lives. And these civilizations were destroyed because of the knowledge contained in this book. Our people are destroyed for lack of knowledge and you can't just jump into knowledge without having knowledge. That's why you ain't supposed to be eating of the tree of life <laughs> or, you know, good and evil. It's a certain knowledge that you don't need, you know, during this particular progression that maybe later, you know, you can gain that type of foundation. You don't get all the knowledge you need when you're 10 years old. You don't get all that knowledge when you're 12 years old. You can't have certain conversations with children that you can have with adults. When they're 18, you could talk about things you couldn't talk about when they were nine, right? So they're giving nine-year-olds knowledge that is destroying them. And these are the civilizations that were destroyed because of the knowledge contained in this book. I have traveled among the stars, trembled before the gods. I have at last found the formula by which I passed through the gate. <laughs> you see it, A-R-Z-I-R, -R, and pass into the forbidden realms of O-I-G-I-G-I. -I -G -I. <laughs> so all these are their frequencies, man. So they got forbidden realms. They got unknown lands where no map has ever charted. I have summoned the ghost of my ancestor to real and visible appearance on the tops of the temples built to reach the stars. Sounds like the Tower of Babel. <laughs> and built to touch the north, nethermost cavities of Haiti. Sounds like the, you know, temple of, what's that? The uh, Thoth's temple, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, man, Hall of Records or something like that, temple, you know what I mean? I have wrestled with the black magician or, here we go. Here comes Thoth again. In vain and fled to the earth by calling upon Bang and her brother, Bang, right? So, Lord of the Double Headed Axe. Wow. So, they call it on these entities. He's wrestling with an angel, kind of like Jacob. <laughs> He's wrestling with the black magician. I have raised armies against the lands of the East by summoning the hordes of fiends I have made subject unto me and so doing found bang, the God of the heathens whom breathes flame and roars like a thousand thunders. Wow. So they flip everything, boss. Because even here you can almost see a Naga flow or a Negus flow or a nigga flow. <laughs> hey, but he's breathing flames, right? So he's still talking a dragon. I have found fear. I have found the gate that leads to the outside. Whoa. We're talking uh, Tarazanta. We're talking gateways, Antarctica. Gates that lead to the outside by which the ancient ones who ever seek entrance to our world keep eternal watch. 
I have smelled the vapors of that ancient one, queen of the outside, whose name is written in terrible M-A-G-A-N text, the testament of some dead civilization whose priests seeking power swing open the dread evil gate for an hour past the time and were consumed. Yeah. So he goes on to tell his testimony. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's dodge day. Let's dodge day symbols. You know, I'm tiptoeing through this stuff, man, but we see what it is. I'm going to read this last piece here. Walking back up the slope that I had so fearfully run down only moments ago, I came across yet another of the dark priests in identical condition to the first. I kept walking, passing more of the robes as I went, not venturing to overturn them any longer. Then I finally came upon the great stone monument that had risen unnaturally into the air at the command of the priests. It now upon the ground, it now upon the ground was more, but the carving still glowed with supernatural light. The serpents, or what I had then thought of as serpents, had disappeared. But in the dead embers of the fire, now cold and black, was a shining metal plate. I wished, or I picked it up and saw that it was also carved as the stone, but very intricately after a fashion I could not understand. I did not bear the same markings as the stone, but I had the feeling I could almost read the characters, but could not as though I once knew the tongue, but I had since long forgotten. My head began to ache as though a devil was pounding my skull when a shaft of moonlight struck the metal amulet, for I know now what it was, a voice entered my head and told me the secrets of the scene I had witnessed in one word. All right, man, you know what I'm saying? So <laughs> sounds a lot like the Emerald Tablets, you know, Thoth taking his, his uh, you know, navigation, you know what I'm saying? Through these uh, cycles and cycles and, you know, traveling to these planes and traveling to these realms. We're just talking about the book of the black earth and earth has a correlation with this cube and platonic solids. This cube represents earth. You know, it's just a towel, like an inverted towel in a sense, right? So the cube itself is not wicked. What they are putting as an intention to make it a black earth is the wicked part, the black part. They're putting the wicked on the earth, the black earth. And here, here we go with this black cube. We're just talking about the book of the dead, man. The book of the dead, man. Yeah, man. All right. You know, we could only take a, <laughs> here a little, there a little out of this Necromicon, man. But, you know, like I said, it seems like they've taken a lot from our energy and flipping it. It says the method of the Necromicon concerns deep primeval forces that seem to pre-exist the normal archetypal images of Terra Trumps and the Golden Dawn telesmatic figures. These are forces that developed outside the Judo-Christian mainstream and were worshipped and summoned long before the creation of the Kabbalah. As we know it, not the creation of the Kabbalah, but as we know it today, hence the ineffectiveness of the Golden Dawn or the Thoth Hermetic School banishing procedures against them. It's ineffective because it predates, you know, a lot of their English flow, you know, a lot of their, you know, duality flow. You, you, it, you got to go to the heat for that. You got to go to the solar flow for that, right? So this is hence the ineffectiveness of the Golden Dawn since they are not necessarily demonic or glyphotic, glyphotic. Q-L-I-P-H-O-T-I-C, in a sense that these terms are commonly understood in the West. They just simply represent power sources largely untapped. 
<laughs> so they tapping into the water and thus far ignored by 20th century mainstream consciousness, man. The result of any experimentation with this book, as well as practical suggestions concerning its rituals, are welcomed by the publishers. <laughs> Amen. All right. I just wanted to confirm who this mad Arab is, man, and what energies they're using in their, uh, you know, more science temple flow, you know, which is the Moabite flow we've been talking about, that Joshua's going to war against, Preston's going to war against, you know what I'm saying? Psalms 83, Confederacy going to go, going to war against, you know, all the cons in, in the Marocca, all their neck goose, you know what I mean? And we take all our frequency back. We know when we talk Naga, you know, we got the Na, we got the end, the Nu, which is the seed in Hebrew, the Nu, the Ga, or gam is literally gathering, you know what I mean? It's a gathering of a seed, or there's also the God, the twisting, you know, this, this dragon twisting, you know what I'm saying? So you got this twisting dragon seed, you know, literally twisting, not twisting like confused, but a dragon that's like Leviathan is literally twisting, you know what I'm saying? So you got a dragon seed basically with this, Naga, but the dragon is the fierce and violent person. The dragon is also an etymology to see clearly. To see clearly. And now we're beginning to see clearly when they talk elders and elder gods and ancient ones. They're referring to ancient Sumerian and Babylonian deities, such as their Murdoch, such as the TMI, all that stuff, right? But it's being also wrapped into these two sections with the more science temple of America called the elder gods and this uh, great seal of national Moorish affairs or this messianic lineage under sea and bay. And perhaps they're splitting off where they're getting their power sources from. Maybe the more science temple it's tapping in, obviously, with these elder guys that are connected, you know, with these certain entities. And then you got the Masonic flow or the Charles Mosley flow or the Moors. <laughs> and they're connected with certain other types of dragons and energies. You know what I'm saying? I mean, either way, we're talking fallen angels, fallen dragons. You know, we got to talk fallen dragons if we're going to talk you know, Quam, Kum, Kum, rising dragons like the seraphim in Isaiah 6 singing holy, holy in the throne of Hawaii. You gotta, you gotta, we gotta factor it all in. And we still got the fire burning, my naga, man. I know. Take a breath, my naga. Go ahead and breathe, man. Go ahead and breathe, man. Let that crackle. Go ahead and soothe you, my naga, man. We, <sighs> Gotta keep the fire burning. All right, so let's get back into now that we see where they're coming from. We know every time we look at it, we get a little clearer with it. Let's get back to where we're coming from, man. Our covenant, right? <laughs> Our covenant, my man. Let's go. I mean, we see where they coming from with. We're just talking our covenant. And uh, you know, I'm definitely gonna get on these comments. So let's talk our covenant. I'm gonna get to the comments and then we're gonna pop off from there. We just getting started, man. Like this is just the this is just the uh the intro on my night. <laughs> it was just the beginning. Get cozy, put your cozy slippers on, let it. Temple, all let's go, man. Because last time we talked Psalms 89. Okay. We just talked, you know, this uh, Psalm 74 with this 
Leviathan's head is being crushed. And here's Psalms 89 11 says, Thou didst crush Rahab as one that is slain. Another dragon. Thou did scatter your enemies with your strong arm, with your arm and your strength. Thine are the heavens, thine are the earth, the world, and the fullness thereof. You have founded them. Back to verse three, for I have said forever is mercy built in the very heavens thou dost establish your faithfulness. I have made a covenant with my chosen. Who's that? I have sworn unto David. So they want to fight fire with fire, right? They, they want to fight fire with fire. You know, they want to summon a dragon to slay a dragon. <laughs> this is witchcraft and necromancy at its highest level. And I'm glad to be digging on it with you because if I didn't have you, my naga, I'll be in a tailspin trying to figure this all out. But because my naga's been you know, steadily dropping that drop. And like I said, we about to get your drop. Your comments, you know what I'm saying? Just copper thread popping off, everybody popping off. It's helped me so much. And I'm glad, and I'm grateful to be here to help you. You know what I'm saying? Put our story back together. Talk of life and talk the righteous being fed in the wilderness. This dragon flow impressed to John, you know, legend and sources where the dragons are at the banquets being rolled all across the earth plane. So we are the dragon, you know, the dragon frequency has always been connected to our earth plane. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, there's this, this mana flow is definitely connected to our Levi, to our dragon and the covenant is established the seed, right? The na, the na, the the naga, the gathering seed, the tribe and seed, the dragon seed. We're talking about a covenant, a wild seed, my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant, forever will I establish your seed, your noon, your na. And build up your throne to all generations, man, including us. This is Hawa's throne being built up, established, our seed, spiraling up like that Kundalini Khan, dragon rising to connect back to the oath, the sworn oath that David's seed will always be established. But you got to keep your code. You got to keep your oath to be back tapped in with the oath. Let's go. Verse 29. Or let's get it at verse 25. I will beat to pieces his adversaries. We're talking David. And smite them that hate him. My faithfulness, my mercy shall be with him. And through my name, not David's name, not Presta's name, not JC's name. Why are you praying through the name of Jesus, right? When there ain't no J in the English language, man, <laughs> until the 17th century. So this ancient frequency you... You love so much, you're praying in the name of JC. It can't be real. It can't be true. And it can't be right when you call it on a J. And you want to change it to a Yahweh Shai? That's not his name. You, you praying in the name of Yahweh Shai now? Hashem, the name. 
Through my name shall his horn be exalted. We're talking dragons, right? I will set his hand also on the sea and his right hand on the rivers, and he shall call me Father. David is calling the creator Father, my God, the rock of my salvation. Thou art my Father, my God, my power, the rock of my salvation. I will appoint him my firstborn. So again, a firstborn son has been appointed. The firstborn son has been sworn unto. My chosen is David. Surely I would not be false unto David. His throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever. His seed shall endure forever. You're going a long time, man. Hosea 3. Chasing after these harlots. Or being a harlot chasing after their gods, their dogs. Well, you shall not play the harlot no more. Verse 4, for the children of Israel shall sit solitary many days without a king, without a prince, without sacrifice, without pillar, without effort, without terrifying. Afterwards shall the children of Israel return and seek the creator most high over everything. Keep the code, because that's what happens when you seek the creator. You keep the code, you listen, and you seek David, my naga. You don't call on the name of David. You seek, <laughs> you seek the con, because you've gone all these days without it without your royalty you want to be you again you seek the covenant the covenant i have made a covenant with my chosen i have sworn unto david my servant forever i will establish his seed build up his throne He shall call me father. You are my father. I will appoint him my firstborn bond, the highest of the kings of the earth. So when we talk Preston, we get witnesses and validation. Like this Robert Grisham book, Medieval Empire of the Israelites, says what? Preston John talking what? We're talking the holy blood, the holy grail, the symbol of the grail is a symbol of authority. The highest of the kings, right? It is part and parcel of the legendary Preston John, the legend of whom was spread widely in the Middle Ages. Widely, Monaga, this ain't no play play. This wasn't no secret. John was the master of a huge empire. He was omnipotent and all powerful. Highest of the kings, right? Kings and czars were to him only subjects. Highest of the kings, huh? Tractactus Polkermus calls John the king of kings. Highest of the kings, right? The highest of the kings of the earth. I'm in Psalms 89, verse 28. I will appoint him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. King of kings, Rex Regnum. He combines in himself spiritual and secular authority. And he can say about himself, he can say about himself, Preston John, by Hawa's grace, 
Lord of all lords, who only are beneath heaven from the rising of the sun to paradise on earth. Prester John is only beneath heaven, man. <laughs> Con David is the highest of the kings of the earth and is only beneath heaven, beneath Hawa. But on earth, he's the highest, which is why you return afterwards. Seek Hawa, your power, and David, your Khan before you come trembling to Hawa and his goodness in the end of days, end of days, end of days. Some say last days. We know we in it. You seeking the creator, you KTC, M-H-O-E. Now it's time to get that mem sauce to get the water flowing and keep the fire burning. Because David, David, your king, that you've gone many days without, is the highest, the highest of the kings of the earth. What's it say, medieval empire, the Israelites, $999 book, <laughs> $999 book. <laughs> President John, by Hawa's grace, who only is beneath heaven, from the rising of the sun to paradise on earth, Preston John controls and holds back the tribes of the Gogs and Magogs, controls the seen and unseen worlds. He impedes the penetration into his kingdom of the lions and giants and all hijacks. John's kingdom is named the empire of the great Khan. I mean, he's the highest of the kings. They said even Xerxes and Alexander the Great and the Roman emperors, Ogier, they all had to visit the kingdom of the Presta, the kingdom of Presta John, so they can be legitimatized, so that they can be legitimate rulers, man. That makes him the highest of the kings of the earth, like the Pope would be today as the king of Vatican City. The highest, the Pope is the Presta. The Presta is the Pope but they've hijacked the title. Who's the highest of the kings of the earth now? You've gone a long time. You've gone many days without a king, without the highest of the kings. But afterwards, Hasharah will return and seek the creator directly and their highest royal covenant that Hawa says, I will always establish your house, raise up your throne to all generations. End of days, David, your Khan is the highest of the kings of the earth, my Nage. John's kingdom is named the kingdom, the empire of the great Khan and in mysterious and miraculous stories that is the Khan father. Bati, house, Khan, house of the Khan, or Vatican, they hijacked it, who sits in the center of the world. Um, does Vatican City sit in the center of the world over there? Italy, Italy? No, nah. that can't be the house of the Khan. That can't be where the Khan father resides. I'm talking the great Khan Managi, the highest <laughs> of all the kings, man. Kind of concepts in the center of the world. According to the descriptions of Marco Polo, we saw Marco Polo's map. <laughs> Hayton, Mandeville, Giovanni, De Plano, Carpini, and others, he was understood as the all powerful sovereign of a huge country, as a wise and happy monarch, which fully corresponds to our version. The main conclusion is the idea of the grail is the idea of imperial power, is the idea of the Khan father. You find the Khan father, you found the Holy Grail. Yeah. I'm talking the hot-blooded Nuggets, man. <laughs> the Holy Blood, man. The 
the holy grail, man, is the Preston. The highest of the kings of the earth. <laughs> the whole earth plane. And I love this part right here because, you know, Dawi, just like Edris, is asking her why. Where's your former mercies, oh, why? Wow, that you did swear unto David in your faithfulness. Remember, oh, wow, the taunt of your servants, how I do bear my bosom, the taunt of so many people wherewith your enemies have taunted, oh, wow, wherewith they have taunted the footsteps of your anointed. They've been taunting Dawi, the footsteps of Dawi. They think they can put us in their magical spells. We don't got no help, right? They're taunting Dawi. They're taunting Hawa. Hey. How much longer shall we endure, right? Where are your mercies, Hawa? Where are you? How long? How long, Hawa, will you hide yourself forever? How long shall your wrath burn like fire? It's like that edges flow. Love to my Brad Dizzle, man. I know he on his edges flow, man. I know this for sure, for sure. But we, your people, whom thou has called your firstborn. Wow. So not only is David called the firstborn in Psalms 89, Twenty-seven, he shall call unto me. Thou art my father, my God, and the rock, my power, the rock of my salvation. I also will appoint him firstborn. I'm just saying, JC is so far removed from this picture. So-called Jesus is so far removed from this picture. The fake Joshua, the New Testament, is so far removed from this firstborn business. Now he comes saying, "He the son." And then they say the son is the father. So now he is God. And now you pray in his name. You must go to the son to get to the father. You are a hijack. You're in the mind of a hijack. He can't be the firstborn son if David is the firstborn son. He can't be the firstborn son if Edris is the first, describing the firstborn being Israel. Israel's the firstborn. David, representation. As the one shepherd is the firstborn. How does it flip to Jesus? How does it flip in the New Testament to a new son? He ain't the firstborn. We are your people. I'm in Edges chapter, second Edges chapter six. Verse 58, my night. But we are people whom you've called your firstborn. Your only begotten, your fervent love, are given into their hands. If the world now be made for our sakes, why do we not possess an inheritance with this world? How long shall this endure? You made the world for our sakes, so why? We the head, not the tail. We only of all the families have you known, Amos 3. You only of all the families of the earth have I known. So I will visit the iniquities, your iniquities. What do you say about David? Oh, yeah, I love you. <laughs> hey, I love that we, you know what I'm saying? But let his children not listen to me, man. It's going to be a problem. <laughs> I 
Yeah, I'm doing all this for David. He's my firstborn, but verse 31, if his children forsake my law, walk not in my ordinances, profane my statutes, they don't want to keep the code, they don't want to keep the commandments, then I'm going to visit their transgressions with the rod, their iniquity with strokes. But you know what? My mercy will always be. With David, man, his, his seed. My mercy will I not break off from him, nor will I be false to my faithfulness. Surely I will not be false unto David. His seed, his seed shall endure forever. How long, Hawa, will you hide yourself forever? How long, Hawa, shall your wrath burn like fire? What's Edris saying? But we, your people, your firstborn, your only begotten, are in our enemies' hands, man. We in captivity. If the world be made for our sakes, why do we not possess an inheritance with this world? Where's your inheritance, Managa? Where's your land? How long will this endure, man? How long shall we endure this? How long will Hawa's wrath burn like the fire? Allow why what well, we do know, what well, we do know, <laughs> what well, we do know, my nigga, is that we're waking up. We are returning out of that wrath. A while got mercy on a nigga. We are returning, seeking our creator directly again. No middleman, no hijack, calling on no other name. We go to Hawa to get to David. We don't call on David's name to get to the creator and you don't got to call on Christ to get to God or maybe their God, you know, maybe their dog, but not the creator. You don't go through nothing to get to the creator. You return, you go directly to the creator. Then you seek David because David is holding down the forever covenant. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David, my servant, forever will I establish your seed and build up your throne to all generations. That mercy is for us forever. You know, David was anointed from a bond bond. <laughs> He's the course correction. They gave us one version you know one story of this you know as we are digging through samuel man and you know kings and all that with saul we dug on how saul has a son jeremiah who jeremiah whose son afghana is raised in the royal court of david and solomon So David rose early, he and his men to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines and went up to Jezreel or Israel. See, these Philistines were mad, son. They wanted to slay David. <laughs> and the Lord of the Philistines, the lords of the Philistines passed by on the hundreds and by thousands. And David and his men passed on in the railroad with Akish. Then said the princes of the Palestines or the Philistines, what do these Hebrews do here? Like, why are these Nagas over here, man? What are these Hebrews doing over here? And the key said unto the princes of the Philistines, is this, is this not David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, who has been with me these days or years, these years, and I have found no fault in him? So Akish is rocking with Dawi. 
You know, we always got favor, even in captivity, man. Even in, you know, oppression, you know what I'm saying? But the princes of the Philistines were wroth with him. The princes of the Philistines said unto him, make the man return that he may go back to his place where thou hast appointed him and let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us for wherewith should this fellow reconcile himself unto this Lord, his Lord. Yeah, we don't want his power fighting on his behalf against us. Should it not be with the heads of these men? Is not this David of whom they sang one to another in dances? Ain't this the David they singing about? Nah, man, we can't rock with him. Ain't he the famous David that they sing and dance about his, his, his journey, his legacy? Saul has slain his thousands and David, his tens of thousands. We're talking about the Vedic, you know, the heart of David, the warrior spirit, the warrior Ruach, the warrior Ruach in Judah, the scepter. And Akish called David and said to him, as Hawaii lives, you have been upright and you're going out and you're coming in with me. And the host is good in my sight, for I have not found evil in you since the day of you, you're coming into me until this day. I've never found no evil in David, man. He comes from a sinless man, Jesse, Yashai. His son, Daniel, is a sinless man. No transgression. He has this righteous frequency about him. Even the hijack can't find no fault in them. Wherefore now return and go in peace that thou displease not the lords of the Philistines. And David said unto Akish, what have I done? And what hast thou found in your servant so long as I have been before you unto this day that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And Akish answered and said to, to David, I know that thou art good in my sight and an angel of Hawah, notwithstanding the princes of the Philistines have said, he shall not go up with us to battle. Wherefore now rise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord, that they come with me. And as soon as you are up early in the morning and have light, depart. So David rose up in the early, he and his men, to depart in the morning to return into the land of the Philistines. And the Philistines went to Jezreel. <laughs> Verse 21, 1 Samuel 30. And David came to the 200 men who were so faint that they could not follow David, whom also they had made to abide at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David and to meet the people that were with him. And when David came near the people, he saluted them. Then answered all the wicked men and base fellows of those that went with David and said, because they went not with us, we would not give them aught of the spoil that we have recovered and save to every man his wife and children that they may lead them away and depart. Then said David, you shall not do so, my brethren, with that which a wise given unto us who hath preserved us and delivered the truth that came against us into our hand and who will hearken unto you in this matter. For as in the share of him that goes down to the battle, so shall the share of him that tarries by the baggage they shall share alike. And it was so from that day forward that he made it a statue and ordinance for Israel until this day. <laughs> so David wanted to break bread. David wanted to share, and you know what I'm saying, whatever inheritance that Nagas was coming up with. So the Philistines fought against Israel and the men of Israel fled before the Philistines and fell down slain in a mount of Gilboa. And the Philistines followed hard upon Saul 
and upon his sons. And the Philistines slew Jonathan, right? So this is when Saul was getting slain. And Abinadab, Abinadab and Malakushua, the sons of Saul, were all slain. And the battle went sore against Saul on the archers, and the archers overtook him, and he was in great anguish by the reason of the archers. Then said Saul to his armor bearer, draw thy sword and thrust me through therewith, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and make a mock of me. So Saul said to his arm, armor bearer to take his life. Now this sounds like <laughs> a lot of these, you know, period peace wars, you know, Game of Thrones is, you know, they all got their armor on and, you know, this is Israel. That's what I'm saying. If knowing that this is over here, you know, makes it a lot more clear that when we talk Swan Knights, Saul was a knight. David knights. These are knights with armor, armor and swords, which is why they're fighting all these swords in Arizona. Kalelus. Where's the press they're at? The whole four corners, right? Everything. Cathay. India superior, which lets you know this is India inferior, my life. And that the superior Naga might be in India superior, my life, right next to Mexico. Come. We're just talking about the British Museum. We're just talking about the British Museum. I love reading Psalms, uh, you know. I love reading, um, you know, Samuel, Man and Kings, and just getting this David flow and going back to the Psalms flow. They found Saul, his three sons fallen, cut off his head, stripped of his army, sitting to the land of the Philistines, ran about to carry the tidings unto the house of the idols and to their people. And they put his armor in the house of their gods, right? And they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshah. When the inhabitants of Gabesh Galilee heard concerning him that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall. And they came to Jabesh and burned them there. And they took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. And then uh, 2 Samuel's 1, you know, David finds out about Saul, you know, rents his clothes and he wells and he fasts. So he didn't want this, you know what I'm saying? David was anointed calm, but it's not something he desired. You know, he wasn't out trying to slay Saul to get the throne. Awa gave a course correction because Israel wanted to be ruled by a king, not a Khan. David is a Khan, Wang Khan, <laughs> to be exact. Saul ruled him as a king. And this was, you know, the destiny, you know what I'm saying, of that journey. And they prayed and, you know, here comes this anointed Dawi, and it says in verse 14, and David said unto him, how was thou not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, go near and fall upon him. And he smote him that he died. And remember, Jonathan, David's best friend, was also killed. You know what I'm saying? So David was really going through it. And David lamented with his lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan, his son, and said to, to teach the sons of Judah the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Joshua. Thy beauty, O Israel, upon your high places is slain. How are the mighty fall? Yeah, you know, David didn't want this, man, but it was his destiny to pick up the scepter. You know what I'm saying? To pick up this you know, Emerald Staff, man, you know what I'm saying, to become the head, not the tail. And they there anointed David king over the house of Judah. 
this flow continues. You know, this is just a peek into the flow when we talk about the Preston. Look at all this hijack city, man. Hijack city. <laughs> hijack city. Always jamming up our legs, man. Always jamming up our legs. This is ridiculous. Look at this stuff, man. Can't even get it off. My bad, y'all. My bad, y'all. So by the time you get to 1165 and the letters of Preston John and Ethiopia, that has a deeper connection to this Sawu flow, this Jeremiah flow, this Afghana flow. All this is all happening. You know what I'm saying? Um, this Preston flow, you know, with these um, kings that are paying him tribute. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Alexander and all them. And everyone has their, their take on it. But 70 kings paid him tribute. And this is why they mad. <laughs> if indeed you can remember the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea, it's all to, it's all to wrote you. Then you can you may calculate the extent of our dominion and power. So along with that we, you know, comes this extent of power. This anointing, this covenant. <laughs> According to Charles F. Beckingham and Preston John, the Mongols and the Ten Lost Tribes. I mean, how many Preston John books are there? We're talking about Greater India. <laughs> all right. At one time or another, all were in play when Pope Alexander III learned of him from his physician. He sent him off with a letter addressed to his dearest son, Dajda Hajjah. John, the illustrious and magnificent king of the Indians, my not. Who's the king of the Indians? <laughs> king David, and who's the Indians? Who was chosen? And who's the covenant with? The anointed. They anointed David over the house of Judah. David was anointed as the chosen one, anointed and sworn to be established. Throne will be established. Even now, Managa, to all generations. And now we call ourselves homeborn slaves because, you know, we ain't trying to fight no more, man. We ain't trying to see clearly no more, you know. You're not looking for the grail. You're not seeking Hawa and David. You're not seeking the Preston. I mean, how long has it been? How long have we gone without a con, without a king of kings, a ruler who is given the power to see the seen and unseen worlds, man. We're talking worlds beyond the poles, man. So this press to rule all the worlds beyond the poles man i think so i think con con john is kind of it all i mean i think right here in america is the house of the con is the center that they all gotta come check back in with the great con the great con managa i mean the con father the great con Now we just the homeborn slave. Is is Israel a servant? Jeremiah chapter two, verse fourteen. Back it up, verse thirteen. For my people have committed two evils; they have forsaken me, the fountain of the living waters, 
and hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They made, you made cisterns that can't hold no water. Your, your gods are no gods, which yet are no gods. Have the nation changed its gods? Have you ever seen the hijack, a nation of hijacks, not just one, but a nation of hijacks change their gods? So when I tell you they worship Jupiter, you don't think they worship Jupiter today, Zeus and Saturn and all this? And this Mesopotamian, Sumerian, fallen dragon situation and then Necronomicon, Necromicon. These are ancient gods. Their holidays today are still to the same no gods, but my people have changed his glory. Damn. So even the hijack don't change their gods. But Israel do. Even the hijack don't switch up. They, they rock for Zeus, they're going to rock for Zeus. But Israel do. I think we're the only nation that changes their gods, y'all. breaks their oath, breaks their covenant like this. For that which does not profit, be astonished, O oh, you heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be you exceedingly amazed, says the walk, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of the living water, And they made them some uh, broken cisterns that can hold no water. It's Israel. A servant? Not nah, for real, for real, my nugget. Is our tribe a servant to the hijack? Or are we home born slaves to the hijack? Is this why we became a prey? Talking that wall. Again, man, a loud wall for you, the water for your comments. And I'm gonna dig on, you know, a little more, you know, uh, this time, you know, I always get a few. And then I want to take it into some great drop, man. I mean, I'm, like I said, I haven't even got to the stuff I want to get to yet. I just wanted to establish what we've established. Talk about, you know, the connection with this magic and the powers back to the covenant and the magic and the power that we got being the head and not the tail. They paid us tribute for a reason. 72 kings paid tribute to Preston for a reason. You're talking a greater magi. Joshua made the sun stand still and the moon for a reason. Greater level magi. So magic is all the way, you know what I'm saying, within us, you know, but they've twisted it, right? They love to JB, he's digging on that fire dance. Hey, hawa, hawa, hawa. Hey, that's the hook. Why? <laughs> they love to all the tribe, man. Yosef, man, CJ, man, you know what I'm saying? Ma, Five Eyes, Ma, everybody, man. Oh, man all my Nagas doing Tribe Up music, man. Look out for us. Get the reconstruction pack right now, my Naga. Get it in the drop shop. Just pop off, man. Get that Ma pack one. Let's go. Hawa, hawa, hawa. JB, what it do? Charmaine Aqua, what it do? It's my fence, fence building fire starting Aqua, what it do? She says, in the truth, I'll make you free. You going to get this word. Bring it out. <laughs> how get how get this breath and breathe? How get this breath? All right. Now, get this breath and breathe. Okay, I got you. <laughs> Allow uh, M-H-O-E. Hey, Sean Linderman said, I'm with you. I love you, brother. I know that you're going to show the nations what truly matters and what Hawa is all about. 
All praise the most high. Hey, we, we going to show them, man. <laughs> we going to show them. Let's go. Your Valine, what it do? To knock on him. We popping off, man. She in that to knock on these sessions. Yeah, JB. Hawa, Baruch, Baruch. Leona Abbott said, if there's a ring around our ring and a ring outside of that ring, who is the true Lord of the Rings? Whoa. We just said Preston, you know, could very well be the kind of all the kinds of all the rings. And is this what the Lord of the Rings is all about? Got to get it. I got to get that again. <laughs> I got to get that Lord of the Rings again. Rings on rings on rings on rings forever into the outer spaces. Wow. Hey, Liana is a serious wave surfer, man. The new Wonder Woman movie has such an issue where the nemesis had a spell on him that he put upon himself, which he could not control, just like the Necromicon. And it gave him riches, but it st stole his life because it never let him rest. Thus, he went around granting people wishes and taking their life force as Trey. As they taken the life of the dragon, the alchemical serpent is taking the life from the vessel, which is the dragon. <laughs> yeah, Hitler probably would not have signed the Antarctic Treaty. Yeah. So they did him in. He probably didn't want to freely share his findings. Yeah, I think he was he was way ahead, you know what I'm saying? So nah, you know, probably not. I mean, that's a good, that's a good point right there. Love to Leona Abbott, uh, Chief Standstill, Ben Israel, what it do? Ben Israel. Hmm, chem, chemistry, science, and mathematics. Con, con. I said, I see you wave surfing. Cause the bros way over there in 2016, sinking of Egypt, Atlantis, Thoth, Slave, Vibration, Hounds of the Bear. We've been on this more and more war since 2016. So don't act like this ain't nothing new, nothing they ain't never heard before, but the pop offness, the connectivity is all happening now. You know what I'm saying? If you tuned in in 2016, you better be tuning in in 2022 and to infinity, man. Let's go. So we said, indeed, Khan just trying to find the fountain of living waters spoken of in Joel, Joel chapter 3, verse 18, and Jeremiah 2, 13. I appreciate the work you put in and for the work that you're putting in, fam. Man. Hey, all praise the while <laughs> to have this energy between all of us. And we got it that Jeremiah, because the bro had mentioned it, I already had pulled it up. So love to the bro for this script. And yeah, it talks about forsaking the creator who is the living fountain, who is the fountain of living water. Uh, you know, this is a real you know, amazing script, man. Go ahead and, you know, meditate on this one for sure. We're just talking about the houses, the families of the house of Israel. Thus says, wow, what unrighteousness have your fathers found in me? that they are gone far from me. Hawa is pleading with us. Israel is Hawa's portion, verse three. This is why they mad, son. His first fruits of increase. All that devour him shall be held guilty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All the nations that have devoured us will be held guilty. Evil shall come upon them, says Hawa. Yeah. The priest said not, where is Hawa? And they that handled the law knew me not. And the rulers transgressed against me. The prophets also prophesied by, well, we're talking bays and L's again. Bay L. Hey. 
hath a nation changed its power, which are no powers. Let's get uh, Joel chapter three. Verse 18, it shall come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and the rivers of Judah, Utah, shall flow with water and a fountain shall come forth of the house of Hawa and shall water the valley of Shittim. <laughs> and it reminds us of this fountain. Yeah, sorry, right. they're going to try to jam up this link but we can still read my noggin we can still read <laughs> yeah man influencing the shift of the search for john and the fountain of youth to ethiopia which won in the 14 15 centuries was a series of actual diplomatic missions from ethiopia first to jerusalem then to mainland Europe, they're looking everywhere for Preston John's realm. Ethiopians never, Ethiopians never understood why Europeans persisted in calling him Preston John when the real title was Naga, <laughs> Negus, King, Khan. The most faithful of Preston John's believers They even argued he was able to control the flow of the Nile River. La Daquata, we were talking about that Blue River, that Mississippi flow, which, if enforced, could put a serious hurt on its Muslim neighbors. Whoa. This is why they mad. Something about this. Again, you got Joshua making the sun stand still and the moon. Preston John controlling the flow of the Nile River. Not the fake man-made Nile over there, but the real Mississippi that feeds all these tributaries. <laughs> and if he controlled that, if he enforced it, this power, it would be a serious hurting. They would be butt hurt. These moors. So what happened? They had to try to get this technology, right? They had to try to get the press out the way. They couldn't have him controlling the Nile River, putting a serious hurt on its Muslim neighbors. We got this piece before. Whoever drinks the water three times without having eaten will have no illness for 30 years. And when he has drunk of it, he will feel as if he had eaten the finest meat and spices, for it is full of Hawa's grace. A person who bathes in this fountain, whether he be of a hundred or a thousand, will regain the age of 32. Know that we were born in Baruch, in the womb of our mama, 562 years ago. And since then, we have bathed in the fountain six times. This is 1165 that this... Preston John letter is written, my night. So this Nagoose who controls the flow <laughs> has the water, which is why you seek Hawa and David. King of Kings got control of the water that gives you more life. You get to regain the age of 32. <laughs> Even when you're over a thousand, just like... Uh, the mad Arab, you know, the mad Arab was over a thousand. He felt weak. If only he got this water. If only he was depressed. It. But not only David could return to 32. He says we were born and blessed. We were born and blessed in a womb with our mother 562 years ago. And since then, they took six baths and turned back to the age of 32. You think it's play play? Do you think it's play play? Preston John is letting readers know that by the miracle of the fountain of youth, he was 562 years old and going strong, not weak, strong. You see the difference 
and the Magi flow. You see the difference in a necromancer versus real magic. They ain't making no sun stand still. They don't got the fountain of the eternal water, my naga. That's Hawa. That's Hawa's water. As a result of this interpolation, building on the fountain of youth, Herodotus had identified the Ethiopia in Ethiopia 1,500 years before, quote, Europe's difficulty in making contact with Preston John was of no moment, Silverberg argues, for he was immortal, which is why Jeremiah is saying what? Whom I will raise up unto you. <laughs> I mean, we're talking Jeremiah. Verse 9, chapter 30. But they shall serve Hawa their power, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto you. I will raise him. I will raise. Who? David, another witness. Jeremiah. Son of Saul. Uh oh. He knows David very well. He's prophesying about somebody he knows will be ri risen up again. Cool. He was immortal. He could wait a while longer to be discovered. Preston John was in that exclusive club of personalities who had staying power for centuries, not just minutes. He was immortal, whom I will raise up. <laughs> I will raise up unto them. Receipts on receipts that we got a covenant that is forever with David. Receipts on receipts that you... Search for the creator and David. <laughs> receipts on receipts, my naga, that this David, this Preston is the king of kings, is the Rex Goose, man, is the king of kings. Controls the seen and unseen world, even got the fountain of you turning back to the age of 32. Yeah, man. putting that hurt on his Muslim neighbors, right? <sighs> They've been searching for the press for a long, long time. The anointed Dawi, they've been searching for a long time. Remember this monument, right? <laughs> this Portugal monument. Portuguese. The Preston John Memorial, right? <laughs> you think it's play play. Unveiled in 1986 by the then Portuguese ambassador to South Africa dedicated to the mythical king, priest, Preston John. Right. And the Portuguese explorers who discovered South Africa, the memorial consists of a large Coptic cross in the center circle, central circle, and the figures of Preston John and the Portuguese navigated. Behind the city hall in Fleming Square stands a monument dedicated to Preston John. Oh, he's an ally. <laughs> then why didn't they ever find him if he's an ally? Oh, I mean, you know, they say they did. <laughs> yeah, man. It don't look like the Muslims and Christians were really fighting each other. It looked like they were really allied. <laughs> you know, they had a confederacy. 
you know, they needed all the help they can get to fight the Preston. Preston John, legend and its sources, man. Crusade text. Let's get it. Aqua Tai made this PDF for a knock. Relatio de David. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Okay. You know, I'm not, I got to apologize for all the Christian hijack they put in these letters, but let's get the babies out. This is a description of the complete advance of King David. And in the fine print, they say, or, you know, in the uh, little description here, it says it describes, in essence, the conquest of Genghis Khan. But instead, he is presented as a Christian king named David, great grandson of Prester John. Letting you know that Genghis Khan stole the title David, is being called the grandson of Prester. He wanted to usurp Prester John. They weren't really related, but Prester John and his father, you know, they were sworn blood brothers. They fought side by side. So when he died, Prester took Genghis under his wing. And then Genghis wanted to be the Khan, wanted to marry David's daughters. David said, no, that's insulting. You're not of my house. You can't just hijack my bloodline because I took you in. It don't work like that. And so let's pick it up in the store. This description, this is, this is a description of complete events of King David, the son of King Israel, <laughs> the son of King Sarkis, the son of King John, the son of King Bula, Bulga Boga. Oh, ah, that's a hijack. Come on. The aforementioned King David. May Hawa protect him, who Hawa protects, who we know that, is the youngest of his brothers, his father, King Israel, may God spare his soul, had six wings, excuse me, <laughs> had six wings, Sarah, had six sons, and he was the youngest of them all. With the death of his father, his firstborn brother succeeded him, and this king, just like his father, King Israel, and his grandfathers and great-grandfathers were subject to the great king of the Persians who was called Khan Kana, which in our language means King of Kings, right? It's like we just got King of Kings, Preston. So different sources are telling us the same thing. It's the King of Kings when they talk Preston John. And these are two hard to find sources, man. So yeah, we're talking about the King of Kings, Khan Kana, King of Kings. And his land was from Kassar up to Belasugun, Belasugun, which is beyond the river, which is called in the Persian language, the Jahan or Jian, which is one of the rivers of paradise, Manai. Promised land, Manai. The aforementioned king of the Persians called together his astrologers and asked them to predict the future and tell them what was going to happen after his death. As is their custom, they took a virgin boy and after cutting off both his arms, damn, this is what Genghis Khan was doing to see if he should go to war against the Prester. He took a boy, a virgin boy, cut off his arms, collected his blood in the vase and implored him to tell the future. The boy before he died, foretold everything to them. Indeed, he said that a certain king, David by name, a very noble man, would make the kingdom of the Persians his subject. The aforesaid Khan Khan, king of the Persians, questioned them about this. If they knew any such king in the provinces who was called David, they said they knew of no one Managa, this is a letter coming out of 1220. Dated 1220. All right. <laughs> so they, they're giving down the rap. And we've been, you know, we've been digging on this David Sauslin. I'm glad they brought it up. Perhaps Kuklu became Arabic Dawood. 
Okay. Whence David, or perhaps the Christians conflated him with David Sauce, the leader of Georgia, famous for his exploits against the Muslims. So all these Davids is whooping up on these Moors, man. And this is why they mad. Whether you're talking David Sauceland or this David here, Dawu, all the same, Naga, talking Khan Khan. So they said they knew of no one who was called by such name. However, King Israel had a very small son who was called David, who was of no importance. Then the aforementioned king said to the astrologers, let us send word to his brother so that they, so that he may send him to us. And in this way, let him, let us kill him and we will free ourselves from his name. So they wanted to free themselves from the name of David. Who again in the Quran, they talk about a Dajjal. The Dajjal is David. Because <laughs> David was slaying all these Muslims. Because they were at war. We're talking a more and more war. For this reason, he sent messengers. Remember that song they, they sung about David? Tens of thousands. Saul slayed a thousand. David, tens of thousands. So his name is well known. So now they're trying to, this, you know, they're getting a drop on David as he's a child. They, they want to slay him when he's young, kind of like J.C., right? For this reason, he sent his messengers to, the, to David's brother, the king of India, that he should send him his brother because he wished to do service to him and honorably advance him. Truly, when David's brother heard mention of this, along with the certain of his devotees, in whom he had great confidence, he sent his brother to the king of Persians, unaware of this vicious plan. And while the boy was coming to the king of Persians, the king greatly rejoiced at his arrival. The boy kissed the ground before him and saluted him most devoutly. The boy was very beautiful. And when the king saw him, he immediately felt pity for him. The two wives of that king were present there, one of whom was the daughter of King John, the paternal aunt of David's father, King Israel. So his auntie was there. All right? The other was the daughter of King Ganesi, from whom he had a son called Philip. Do you fear God? They asked him. This boy came to you under your faith and is under your protection. And he touches your carpet with his feet and you want him to be handed over to death for nothing. And his wives greatly reproached him for this. For one was a Christian woman, namely the paternal aunt of the father of David. And the other was an unbeliever <laughs> so or unbeliever in Christianity. So maybe she was a Hebrew. Right? So the king felt shame in his heart and considered what he should do. Finally, with divine permission, he allowed him to return to his native land. So Hawa always looked out for David. Without delay, the boy rode off with his men. And with God staring him on, he rode for 40 leagues by night and day, speeding up his return by changing his horses often. After this, the king and scribes and astrologers came to him and reproached him that he did wrongly because he allowed the boy to return. Then the king was immediately sorry for what he had done. So he sent horsemen after him. Sound like Moses now, right? <laughs> Chariots, right? But they didn't find him for indeed he had escaped by divine will and at length, he came to his brother's land. So just like Moses was spared, David was spared as a youth as well. The aforementioned Khan Khan, the king of the Persians, came to oppose him and with a great multitude. They fought each other then by divine will and with the help of the living cross. We're talking about Hawa. King David prevailed and subdued him. And the greater part of his people was killed except those who cleansed themselves. With the bath of baptism, or are we talking about the living water? Where Hawa is saying, I am the living water. They're talking about baptism. <laughs> Didn't uh, David say, uh, you know, <laughs> and his people turning back to the age of 32? They took how many baths in the fountain? Six. Would this be a baptism before the Christian baptism? Except they're being dunked in water that turns them back to 32. <laughs> Living water, not 
let's take a dip in a in a bathtub, you know what I'm saying? But living wata managi. Yeah, man. So here's another story substantiating David, very close to the Moses flow, very close to him being anointed in the script as well. You know what I'm saying? Now you got this fountain situation. They call it bath of baptism. <laughs> Indeed, the Afro said Khan Khan, a king of the Persians, was captured, bound by golden shackles and led captives on the chariots to the land of King Dawi. And I'm just letting you know that this is being spoken of. This press the flow, Genghis Khan changing his name to David, stealing the titles. Oh, yeah. The aforementioned King David afterwards fought with the king of the Afrasid land, which is called al Nar, and he subdued him, subdued him, and almost the entire people of his was killed, except that part which was converted to our faith. And having subjected to him the whole land, he returned to the land called Kata. <laughs> Kata, like the Kara Kata. And at that, at that time, there was a truce between the king of Kata and Kavarizmizam, or Kwarizm Shah, and the lands between them were undivided, namely Bakara and Samarkand and Belakset, or Balasa Ogum. The aforementioned Shivari, Shavarmizam, or Kwarizm, like the Kara, or Kara, which means black and turkic or melanated sent his messengers to king david made peace with him and gave him all the land he held beyond the river john love to templar g-e-o-n is john all right so river john <laughs> after he was safe from king david he brought together the greatest people and went over a certain province called kara san and over grand or great arak and small are which are great provinces in Dara Bashin, and he came to within six days of Baghdad. I mean, my nag, you know what I'm saying, you know, I'm spelly flopping, but look, these nagas was at war, and it's being documented. In the 1200s, these Nagas was at war. And Genghis Khan was going to war against the real David and stole the title David, stole the title Khan. I'm telling you, it's a more and more war, my Naga. He gladly wished to enter into agreement with King David, who? The Caliph. Oh, okay, they want an agreement. Now they want a treaty, but he utterly refused. No treaties, no hijacks. So the Quarism people came together with innumerable people, crossed the river Gian and prepared himself to powerfully oppose King David. King David strongly defeated him on the field of battle. And a greater part of his people, the hijacked people, were slain. Because that's what David do. Certain people pledge allegiance that he perished. Others are uncertain where he may be. Or certain people allege that he perished. Others are uncertain where he may be. Shala. You know, it's breaking it down, man. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we'll come back and, you know, take our time with all these, man. But you see what it is after this King David, who may may he always triumph and live, sent to the Caliph of Baghdad, his messengers, who when they entered Baghdad, carried a banner over their heads, on which was a cross. The Saracens said to him, why do you carry a cross over your head <laughs> when you were in Baghdad? And in the presence of Saracens, the messengers replied, our Lord King David ordered us to enter this land in this way or not at all. And their cross is the tower. Remember, Joshua had to robe filled with crosses, man. We're talking a kind of kind, the king of kings, man. We still got that fire burning. We still got that water flow. <laughs> You already know we got that water flowing. 
And you know, we got that fire burning, man. And you know, as we start thinking about a dismount here, you know, we've been talking about Antarctica. <laughs> it would seem that these recent, that this recent, as recent as the Middle Ages, Antarctica was free of ice. As recent as the Middle Ages. So all these maps, like the one in the British Museum, all that, Antarctica would have no ice then. And our Nagas would be traveling to and fro, set up, you know, Holy Land is popping off. It would seem that the temperature of this part of the world changed around the same time as the Little Ice Age descended on Europe, <laughs> descended everywhere. They came over here and found colder temperatures than in Europe because they were in a freezing cold. Hence the glaciation lines go get the drop. Antarctica became covered with ice, became covered with ice. And we talked about their magic for a reason, their spells. Was it powerful enough to freeze stuff over like this? Is this Hawaz doing? Hawaz magic. A lot is going on right here, man. We, we, we're just getting the drop. This is the reflection on Levina Stein and Shoa <laughs> by Brother Gilbert Bloomer, man. I'm not going to tell you, man, we, we surf in the wave. In real time, we surf in the wave, man. <laughs> We're looking for the San Manuel River. It says it was the volcanic strait that separated Australia from Asia. Australia, we know we're talking about Antarctica. So wherever that connection is, you know, which might just be that area that, you know, South America is touching Australia, man. You know, it might be something around this Arnon, but the name of the Sabah or Sheba is a memory of this volcanic Sabata Strait or River. While much of Northern Mu had already gone under the water in 535. But now you from Africa. <laughs> what about Mu that went under water? Nah, you from Africa. So these underwater lands, we shouldn't even factor them in. Nah, you from Africa. I know everything, boss. Y'all from Africa. <laughs> damn, 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 damn. Ofer and the cities in the south still existing, even though the continent may have already been starting to dry up and become more desert-like. Wow. Scientists from the University of Western Australia claim that the Swan River once carried a huge volume of water, that the weather in the past was much Wetter, it would seem that some of the coastlines of Western Australia may have fallen into the ocean around 535 AD when a huge heavenly object <laughs> or a dragon <laughs> struck Northern Australia or Antarctica and created the Dark Ages in Europe. Con, con. Piece by piece, we're going to piece this story together. Allow why? Now, we've been circling around this Ophir drop, just picking it up, belly flopping. It says the great city of Ophir or Safir, also or called the city of gold, was built at the mouth of the great river flowing from the huge canyon bigger than the Grand Canyon in America. Another place that has been said to have been settled by Egyptian, Phoenician, Israelites. <laughs> okay. Ancient accounts spoke of the houses being on stilts and beehives shaped in a land of great valleys or canyons. This whole area was, was destroyed and sunk into the sea at the later date, along with much of this land of Mu, Sheba, Punt. Remember, Sheba is Shambhala, or Sibola. The Great River was in ancient times known as the Eridanus River, Red River. 
in the Indian Ocean was called the Eridanus or Arithian Sea. The Eridanus River was also called the Cygnus or Swan. Remember the Swan Boats and Swan Nights of Ships of Solomon, Forbidden Histories of America. There is an ancient Greek myth that tells of Phaeton or Paton, P-H-A-E-T-O-N, the son of Helios falling into the Uranus River and his friend Cygnus uh, mourning for him and turning into a swan. Okay, man, they got to find their own swan uh, to connect to the story. The Eridus, the Eridanus constellation is also called with his Babylonian name, Babylonian name, Star of Eridu. Some observers have even claimed to identify wall-like structures and pyramid-shaped objects in the Perth Swan Canyon. All right. Got to dig on the Swan Canyon. The great city of Sheba may have been in the ancient mouth of Fitzroy River, many miles into the present ocean. At one time, there was a merchant's trade route that went directly southeast from Sheba to Ophir. Remember, these are children of Joktan and children of Cush. Like those are two Shebas and both uh, bloodlines. Two, two uh, Havilias. Uh, Ofer, I know, is in Joktan's line. Some also have it in uh, the same Cush line. So you know, what I mean, they seem to be duplicates with this. But who's the real Sheba? Well, the real Shambhala Sheba. Stand on up. When the climate was wetter, this area was very fertile with huge lakes now like Lake Austin. In the early days of British settlement, this area was found to have a remnant of a white tribe. All right, come on. As the aborigines of the area were taller, fairer skinned, some of them blonde. These people are obsessed with putting their images on antiquity, no matter what they do. And so Tartaria, just, just look out for it. We're going to get some Tartaria dropped though, but you know what it is, rather than black or copper. Yeah, yeah. We're talking about the remnant, right? And the Americans are the copper color tribes found here, right? Come, on, let's go. The Lake Austin settlements may have been part of this ancient inland kingdom of Heber. Eber. Hebrew, which is Quivera, Kiber, its major center being Lake McKay or the Lake Austin site may have been a settlement in the land of Ophir. I mean, where's Ophir? Some say Philippines. They're talking about Lake Austin. Are they talking about Australia? <laughs> Antarctica? Southwest from Ophir was the city of Kadar near the Gracetown, Margaret River area of Western Australia, man. So, you know, they, they get into, uh, I mean, a little more of this ice age, a great catastrophe occurred in the Southern Hemisphere, 1530 AD, which changed the hemisphere dramatically. It was the last in a line of catastrophe catastrophes to hit the world it was the events of 1530 a.d Managi. uh when was this map 1530 a.d british museum preston john in america india superior asia Anna. So in 1530s, they know where Preston John is, man. Huh? They know what it is. They know where the king of the Indians is. They already know. 1530, these events happened that froze Antarctica, man. Ice Age, right? Trying to take down the Preston, what they do? Freeze the land. Preston John controls the flow of the Nile. What they do? Freeze the land. So maybe if he freeze the Nile, he can't control it. Drastically changing the coastlines of Antarctica. 
huge tsunamis hit Australia, Antarctica, New Zealand, sunk many lands, right? So all this is happening. Let's get over to this document right here. This is the One World uh, Tartarian document, man. And again, we just talking about Tarzanka. Don't mind us. When they keep talking Australia, all this is Australia. It's all this, it just means a southerly direction. So all this Antarctica is Australia. So we're going to get back on that Moroni, man. <laughs> and what does it got to do with the gateways? Even the mad Arab said he saw the gateways, right? Unknown lands, right? Holy lands, Tarazakta. One World Tartarians, Black and White by James Lee. Let's get a piece of this, man. We're going to probably pick up right here uh, in Preston 97, man. I can't believe I'm saying this, man. Preston 97. Oh, man. Uh, there's so much to do. <laughs> so much in this document, really, though. I'm going to do a super belly flop, but we going we going to study this thing through you know Dodger on hijack you know he he he's really going in for tartaria but in the process he uncovers minis of babies out of the bath water yeah, i'm just belly flopping man oh yeah Oh, man, we can pick up so many places here. I'm, you know, let, let's try this one here, man. Uh, wow. <laughs> hey, this this link got the drop drop. We got a piece of it before, but nowhere near in uh entirety. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we're here talking about the time shifts, the chronology, man. We got on some of that before, 333 years, 1,000 years, 1,800 years. I'm just going right in the middle of this joint. And I'm going to work my way back, man. Okay. Let's just see what we got right here. Man. All right. So, <laughs> Thus, the USA was established in 1776 from the American splinter of the Mongol Empire. American splinter. Pay, pay close attention. Since Moors were the Tartarians, according to the Gothic architecture all over the world, but mainly in the Americas, this means that modern day Europeans did not build any of these Greco-Roman Gothic structures in old world America because a previous advanced American civilization called Moors and Berber, Barber, Indians, India, all one and the same people. Well, we're talking tribal because they are both the Khmer or Khan, Kim, Shim, Kham, Ham. So there's, you know, they, they want to make it all one thing so they can leave some room for Tartaria, right? But let's go, man. People from India superior, right? And who's the superior Naga, the Rex Nagus of India superior, right? <laughs> So we're just talking about the land of Prester. John, don't get it twisted. For the dismount, my naga, let's get it. So these barbars, these swans, right? Swan knights. These nagas from the land of Mu are the nagas of India superior that civilized the world. And this post is a map of India superior in the Americas. Managa, your civilization in Americas civilized the world. They didn't say Africa, man. America, man. Everything's in reverse. This map is very significant because it demonstrates that the Americas is Asia major. 
Asia proper, right? Arab proper, aka the Orient, the East. America is the East. America is East, not West. It actually makes perfect sense that ancient Greece and ancient Rome was in old world America. But we're talking red money, pomegranate and August, because the Americas is the true old world. How many places do we got to bring it out from? The birthplace of civilization is here. As we have already proven correct in my previous blog post, the Americas is Atlantis and the origin of the ancient Egyptian civilization. But Atlantis is not original. Those gods don't belong here. Poseidon didn't belong over here. So you got to start way back and you got to kick this Atlantis off your land because it became Egypt and these Moors are moving with permission of the Pharaoh, my God. This means that everything in the Near East is just a reflection of the greater Westerner or the Far East. Ain't this everything we saying? It's crazy, man. By the time I drop my book, I'm going to have to cite all these other sources that have been saying the same thing that we've been saying. <laughs> I got to give them credit for repeating stuff that we've been saying, man. <laughs> Let's go, Drop Nation, man. Everything in... Their world is a reflection of our world, the Far East. And they found Greek and Roman coins in America. So there's nothing new about the Americas and Greece and Rome was also in old world America. Don't you got Rome, Georgia? Well, let's go. It's hard for people to understand that everything in the Near East is just a reflection, a duplication, a phantom of everything that we had first in America. Yes, including, including Egypt, Atlantis, because Egypt was a global blackamoor civilization, okay? The Americas is old world, Egypt, Tamari, the land of Moor, the, the, the Moor, we're talking of Mary, the land of Mary, or we're we talking Mary M. Moses' sister, you know, Mexico, Mexico, Mary, because the ancient Egyptian god, Pata. Now they keep putting this Pata, Tartarians are doing it. You know, these more science people keep trying to put the Pata over the Utah, but your Egypt don't predate Judah. <laughs> your Egypt, your Egypt don't predate these bloodlines, you know what I'm saying, coming out of Isaac, coming out of Abraham. Egypt is more recent than you think, my life. <laughs> All these people just conquered us here. Oh, Pata is Judah. Oh, yeah. So, Presser John's coming out of Pata. Cut it, man. Just stop the malarkey, man. Their frequency don't predate your frequency. I'm not just talking the titles of Egypt. Egypt just means bondage, man. You know what I'm saying? Judah was there, you know what I'm saying, with his tribes in bondage, right? In Egypt, under Joseph, right? <laughs> Joseph had the drop. Joseph had the keys, right? Because his territory, Utah, Judah, which covered Mexico and several states, California, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, Oklahoma, Missouri, and Tote, Texas. Batai was the chief god of Luxor. Again, Judah has nothing to do with the chief god of Luxor. Judah has everything to do with Jacob everything to do with the Baruch of Hawa. These Atlantean powers 
are coming from the power of the creator. They got their Babylonian power, their Sumerian power. They got their fallen angel Atlantis flow. That is not the same as the creator. So you can't put it all together. Oh, that is that. And all this is Egypt and all of them are serving the chief God of Luxor. Like, come on, man. They want to put it all together so they can hijack it. So I said, Dodger on hijacks. We got 360 Dragonfly perspective, man. Let's go, man. Let's go, man. <laughs> yeah, we popping off, man. Um, yeah, I'm gonna take my time with this link, though. You know, they they do got some strong babies in the bathwater. They're talking about the Arabic etymological ancestry, Anasazi, Apache, Arawak, Arakana, Kavin. Cherokee or Karaka, Cree, Ohogan, Hoopa, Hopi, Maka, Mohican, Mohawk, Nazca, Zulu, Zuni, only a few. Let me back it up a little bit. <laughs> back it up a little bit. Now it says the original American Moors were likely Islamic. Stop it. Cut the malarkey. Why? Why? Give me a reason. Islam was in America and had a big influence on America. Okay. <laughs> we know we had uh, the tribes of Lot going after their own Lot, right? Going after their own power. Because you have a total of 565 names, 484 in America and 81 in Canada, villages, towns, mountains, lakes, rivers, etc., are etymologically Arab. I'm sorry, did you forget about Arab proper? Did you forget about the, the distinction between Arab proper and the pretending Arabs? And that Ishmael are the pretending Arabs, they're not considered Arab proper. They're not coming out of Afghana in there. They're not coming out of Joktan in there. So because these place names are etymologically Arab, that creates your conclusion that, you know, the original American Moors were likely Islamic. Nah, these are Hebrews. These Nagas are cold keeper Nagas following the code of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Arab proper. It's not air pretenders, man. But I'm glad we know the difference. Hey, we surfing the wave, man. We are surfing the wave. Many of these names are, in fact, the same names in the Islamic place. Mecca and in Indiana. Oh, we saw that. We saw that one. <laughs> Muhammad and Illinois. Oh, man. Cut it, man. One just has to look for it because you can see the evidence from Queen Khalifa, California, to Alabama, Alabama. Come on, man. <laughs> You're going to put your Allah with the Alabama, or we're we just talking El, Abba, Ama. Alabama is El Abba, Al Abba, Ama, father, mother, frame, and shaper. It's not Ali Bumbaye. <laughs> you see what the hijack do? This reminds me of the creatures in the desert versus the righteous in the wilderness. Alabama is al Aba Ama. Ain't I got no nothing to do with Bumbaye Allah. Cut cut the shit. Cut the shit, man. Morristown, New Jersey. Oh, we saw that one. Islam or so because they hijack, put they reflection on things now the beginning the original has got to be them right they're not the barbers they're not the sylvanus bravos they're not the sons of sarah because they're not even the sons of abraham lot is not a son of abraham cut it <laughs> well have you ever heard the spanish inquisition of doom diverses 1452 we have heard about that shout out to the bro lex man Issued by the Pope, authorizing Christians to enslave Saracens. Non-believers take their lands because no one disappeared. 
It's just that everyone has become ignorant. Yeah. His story or the real. For the dismount, let's get it from here. It says, however, the word Lenape. Uh oh, how do we get to Lenape? I'm just belly flopping. Additionally, if you read subsection four of the Delaware law, it would tell you that the Lenape Indians were formerly known as Moor, signing treaties like the Treaty of Fort Wayne with the Delaware, right? The Lenape were Delaware Moor. Originally, however, the word Lenape means we the people, like Cherokee, huh? Or true people, Lenape also means serpent or dragon, Naga or nigga, uh oh, or Negoose. So are they talking fallen dragons or rising dragons? Likewise, Indian names like Sioux and Dakota also mean dragon because the moors or indians and named themselves after the dragon wisdom that they worship oh no nah, man oh actually the moors do worship this serpent i can't even switch it for for y'all because y'all really doing this you really summoning dragons right necromicon style mad arab style for the dismount. Y'all are summoning this. Y'all are worshiping this. <laughs> Y'all worshiped it when Moors ruled the world. Where does Islam come from? Did it come from Mecca, California, Media, Indiana, Mecca, Indiana, or Morocco, Indiana? <laughs> Did it come from Sufism or Sophia, which was a science that comes from india do all religions come from india superior in the americas now in the eyes of the hijack hebrews whoa 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 now you sounding a whole lot like us man i was letting you slide with the info but ain't no one talking hijack until we start talking hijack ain't no one put hijack together with this investigation <laughs> The hijack Hebrews Templar. Not all Templars are considered in your hijack philosophy, but to you, you know, these tribes of Israel might be hijacks to y'all. But the fact that you said hijack Hebrews lets us all know where you're getting, you know, a lot of core information in this drop because you know they ain't talking hijack. <laughs> you know they ain't talking like this, man. We made you feel comfortable to say the word hijack when it comes to this investigation, man. <laughs> you didn't know what to call these people. India Superior. Yeah. It seems like everything's coming out of India Superior. Now, in the eyes of the hijack Hebrews, aka the Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburgs, uh oh, we're talking Charles and them. The Holy Land was in possession of infidels, aka Muslims. Moors or Israelites, because they were all in Confederacy, man. Maybe you just ain't really seen clearly. Therefore, they were authorized via Doom Diverses 1452 to take Muslim Jerusalem. Stop it, man. Now, the Moors did treaties to take Israelite Jerusalem, the Americas, the Granada the pomegranate, the granda. The Moors didn't have possession of it because it's not their inheritance. They wanted possession of it. Whom were Saracens also read Doom the Verses, which authorized the Templars to conquer Saracens and pagans. What are we talking about? The Christians, man. Because <laughs> we know that the Templars were actually founded by the house of Rus and by the house of the Franks. This papal bull and none of them were ever rescinded, which is the current problem that Moors in America face as Saracens who are the red ones, AKA the lost tribe of Israel. 
So the Moors, all the lost tribes of Israel, and their Moab, and their Canaanite. The, the mad Arab came for the lost tribes of Israel, and all these spells are to help Israelites. Here you go, putting it all together again to hide something very important. The more and more war. I mean, more means great. So I guess the Israelites are great. The Mongols are great. But it's a tribal war when it comes to the more. <laughs> the red copper color con. The papa bull was issued against the Moors. The papa bull was issued against certain tribes of Moors in order to take over Muslim Jerusalem or the kingdom of Israel, which was Palma Granada, Granada Nova, 1597, Matt, you will see the famed seven cities of Sibala, Shimbala, for the dismount, we're talking Shimbala, Sibola, the seven cities of gold surrounding a lake on the said map. We're talking Lake Kapala. Uh-oh. They don't mention it, but we know we're talking Lake Kapala. Granada has the same name as pomegranate in Spanish. Yeah, that's that's Roman. That's Riman. Riman means pomegranate, means Roman, means the Granada cons. So to say that they're Romans means that they have a, a tie by inheritance to the seven cities of gold, Septimania. I'm talking the lost tribes of Israel. <laughs> We're talking America. We're talking the promised land. The symbol of the promised land is the pomegranate because pomegranate appears throughout the streets of Granada in Spain. <laughs> they found the pomegranates right here. As you wander around the city, the pomegranate is also associated with the promised land of Israel because the pomegranate is a metaphor for the richness of the promised land. They got a surrounding lake, right? <laughs> they talking about a surrounding lake and the seven cities of gold, Cibola, Cibola, Cibola. So we're talking forbidden histories of America. Shout out to Daniel Lowe. And, you know, again, we're talking Lake Kapala right quick. You know what I mean? We'll, you know, continue to spiral up on this investigation here, man. But he's saying, right? He's saying <laughs> that you got a lake, Lake Kapala. Let's put this together. According to the legend, many old maps, 15th and 16th century, right? 1530, same thing. There was a large lake located in the basin area of a north eastern Utah, a lake left over from BC times, where in a vast ocean of water once covered the majority of eastern Utah, Judah, and into Colorado and Wyoming. So this large lake connected at one time to a vast ocean of water, a, prime, a primal ocean. To better understand how it is possible for this lake to exist from the days of the crucifixion 2,000 years ago, dies the hijack, and surviving apparently into 900 to 1,000. This is when the Anasazi migration popped off, left to the Hakan. I had suspected for years a remnant of the ancient ocean. Managa, this is ancient primary water which once covered the eastern half of utah for some time i played with the idea of the basin area of northern eastern utah retaining a lake having been fed by the underground primary water my night rivers that are more abundant under our utah mountains and i'm gonna put some great information on primary water on the reconstruction pack you know yosef has been doing major recon so Get the reconstruction pack. We're going to get on that primary mem sauce, man. Love to yourself to real not spiral. We out of here. It is my belief that this lake existed from the days of the crucifixion to about 900 AD when another earthquake mentioned by the Romani Hebrew colonies, Roman Jewish, Remon, pomegranate, Remon, 
pomegranate, Hebrew colonies, Native American legend occurred, causing the source waters to return. So the this lake dried up because it went back underground. It's connected to the underground rivers. The source water returned to the underground, subsiding day by day until about a thousand. Managa, this is when what? You got Israel the third and all them crossing into the Toltec lands, setting up the Tinoch Titlan and all that. So, all right. Okay. All right. So this map was supposed to exist. I mean, this lake was supposed to exist 33 million years ago, according to science. But this Cibola, which is Kalelus, which means promised land, Cibola, which looks like this on a map, C-E-V-O-L-A or U, Cibola, also spelled C-I-B-O-L-A, also called Shambhala or Shabala. Shabala is the same thing. Let's go. It's a guarded secret, my nigga. But this lake is popping up. And around this lake, they got seven cities, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it's on multiple maps. Cibola, Cibola, Shambhala. And this lake was attached to an ancient ocean, right? Granata, Palma Granata. The lake is here. So that's three maps that got Lake Apollo with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cities around it. And we're hearing that it's connected to an ancient ocean. And on the Google Earth today, you can still see it. <laughs> But it's supposed to be 33 million years ago, but it's the same. Con, con, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, I mean, you know, it could be something, could be nothing. <laughs> but this author seems to think a whole lot of this Lake Kapala. Kapala, you know, seems to roll off the tongue sound like Capilia. you know we talk Capilia, we're back to talking that owaspi and this deliverer flow you remember that you know what i'm saying i mean does kapala have anything to do with Capilia for the disc and what did the owaspi dictionary have to say about Capilia? i mean one of the most comprehensive dictionaries especially dealing with these hijacks and speaking this language of theirs man but i mean they got moshe you know this this bible is supposed to be more recent and i like it only because it's connecting a lot with the americas just like kind of uh the mormon joint does so we can do a lot of comparisons with it and you got capilia so again i say capalia now we got capilia right you know he's a deliverer <laughs> just like Moshe, a man of India. We've been talking India superior, contemporaneous with Moses. Contemporaneous means living at the same time. So you're saying there's a figure living at the same time as Moses, just like China, also a deliverer, also contemporaneous with Moses and Capilia, I'm saying, I've never heard this comparison before, but just, I'm just literally surfing away. What does Lake Capilia have to do with this Capilia? What does China have to do with this Chinese, <laughs> this China, who we got a little bit of this, you know, text before. He's being raised up by uh, Jehovah or Hawa, you know, the creator, and He's going out, you know, trying to shake off all this hijack from the people and return the people. Same thing as Cap is doing, no Cap. <laughs> Letting them know if you don't stop, it's going to be a Cap on Antarctica's chest bone. He's representing India. Papilla's representing India. China's representing 
China, both of these, India and China, <laughs> are both in India's period. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, it's all happening. You got the China, you got Mexico, you got Preston John. All this is happening, man. All of this is happening, man. I can't make this stuff up. So Capilia rocking with Moshe at the same time. And just like Moses, why is he being compared to Moses? And what is Lake Kapala about? Like Moses, he delivers the faithists or the Israelites out of bondage. Come on, man. So he frees the Naga. Capilia frees the Naga. Not by migration, but by establishing their freedom throughout India. To establish their freedom without migration, that means he had to go to war. <laughs> he said, no, we ain't, we ain't moving. We ain't migrating. We're going to establish ourselves right here. He also wrought miracles. Spelled Capella. Uh-oh. A star was named after now. Capella, C-A-P-E-L-L-A, -L -L -A, looks a whole lot like this C-O-P-A-L-L-A. C-O-P-A-L-L-A looks a whole lot like this C-A-P-E-L-L-A. Oh, boy. I think I think we hitting home, boss. So Capilia frees the Naga out of captivity, not by migraine, but by establishing their freedom throughout India, or we're talking India Superior and Lake Kapalia, my Naga, for the dismount, best dismount of all time, as we always do, man. <laughs> so I think this Kapalia may have something to do with Capilia, is all I'm saying. And it all has everything to do with Kalelus and Cibola. And Cibola has everything to do with Shambhala. And this is where these Naga Khans, you know, were already holding down from the 700s, 600s, and so forth. Prince Madak, King Owan, uh, Grufu II, Sinan, or Kanan, or Canaan. But choose your Canaan because they spell Kanan like this as well. Or are we just talking Anion, my Naga? Huh? We got Hawak, Mar, kids of Kowato, <laughs> of the Toltecs. I mean, all you was already here. King Israel the seventh, Rhoda, Kalelus, Isaac is popping off, Hawak, Mark, Hawat Zin, Priest King, Preston John is already popping off. Makir of Kalelus, Mix Kowato of the Toltecs is Americ. America, priest king of the Toltecs is already here. All this is in America. All this is in America, man. All these heirs rules are already in America. We're talking Septimania, seven cities of gold. Shambhala, Cibola, seven cities, my nigga. They're finding the artifacts, the crosses on them from the egg, the beginning, AD 700, 900. Nothing but the cross. While the war was raging, Israel died. Pray for the soul of Israel. May the earth lie light on him, on thee. He adds glory to the ancestral glory. Israel, defender of the faith. Israel reigned 67 years. These are on these lead crosses being found all over Arizona, man. And we just saying, man, we really, really can't make this stuff up, man. I mean, we really, really can't make this stuff up. We just talking Shambhala, Cibola, Khan. Cibola, Cibola. Preston John was the title of a priest king who reigned over a mysterious kingdom of the Indies like Kapala. There were some though who came to believe Preston John was really the emperor of Ethiopia. Yeah, man. We're talking great Shambhala, man. Yeah, we're going to get more into Shambhala. You know what I mean? We've been talking about some Cibola, you know, for so long. But Shambhala, 
is the same history, but told in this mythicized Hebreo form, you know what I'm saying? But we're just talking about paradise. The many points of coincidence between Shambhala and the descriptions of the kingdom of Prestija also allow us to look toward a tropical location in the Indies. So they start linking it with Preston John, the most important document concerning. And again, this book is called Shambhala and Preston John's Realm as Historical Kingdoms. Man, Preston is everywhere. And all the histories, he <laughs> Preston's coming up, so you can't ignore. You want that found of you? You want that King David flow, that Hosea 3? No matter where you look, you're going to find a Preston. The most important document concerning the historical Preston John is the letter that fabled monarch to the kings of Europe, including the Byzantine and the Holy Roman Emperor. Everywhere they got the letters, they got receipts. <laughs> While it's popular these days to discuss the letter as a hoax, there is a strong argument of authenticity as well. Let's go. We will discuss this in the section of Preston John's kingdom. If we accept the description given in Preston John's letter, we first note that he claims his kingdom extends over the three Indias. The idea of three Indias first appears in Europe in the Ravina cosmography, which was written in the 7th or 8th century. The concept confirms to that of the Islamic view of the three Indias, Hind, Sand, and Zanj. They were known respectively in Europe as India Major, extending from Malabar to India Extra Gangi, Gangim, India Minor from Malabar to Sin, and India Tertia, Tertia, the coast of East Africa. Oh, man, we talking Antarctica. <laughs> Let's go. The idea of Central Asia or Siberia region as part of the three Indias was not found at this time. So we can see the southern direction of the kingdom of Preston John. There's a number of interesting correspondences between the kingdoms of Preston John and Sibola, Shambhala, which is also Sheba, which means daughter of the oath or daughter of the seven, as in seven cities. Let's go. Preston John was a priest king. The ruler of Shambhala was a king and a lama. And we got from Preston John legend and sources that the Preston John title predates the Dalai Lama title, that the original Dalai Lama is the Preston, is the priest king, is Dawi. The Lama is a religious teacher whose duties cover those of the priests in the Western church. Both kings were described as emperors ruling over a large number of subject kingdoms. The Shambhala king ruled over 96 minor kings, while Preston John was said to have 72 subject sovereigns. Kings from both regions are said to be involved in the future dualistic final battle that would usher in a golden age. Man, we're talking about Genghis Khan, Preston John. The 25th Shambhala King is prophesied to fight in a future battle against a barbarian known as the Lalos, L-A-L-O-S, in Preston John's letter, he mentions that he controls the nations of Gog and Magog, with, which will be loosed in the end times to ravage the world, including Rome, after an alliance of 15 nations led by Gog and Magog are defeated. The letter speaks of a descendant of Preston John victoriously rescuing Europe. <laughs> yeah, they wish, man. <laughs> These accursed 15 nations will burst forth from the four quarters of the earth at the end of the world in the times of the Antichrist or King David, whom I will raise up, let's go, and overrun all the abodes of the saints as well as the great city of Rome, which, by the way, we are prepared to give to our son who will be born along with all Italy, German, Germany, and the two Gauls, Britain, and Scotland. Man, man. We shall also give him Spain and all the lands as far as the ICC. Presta gets it all, man. The nations to which I have alluded according to the words of the prophet shall not stand in judgment on account of their offensive practices, but will be consumed by ashes, by fire, which will fall on them 
from heaven. So that rainbow's in the sky, you're not going to get flooded again, but there will be a consuming fire. <clears throat> there will be a consuming fire, my noggin. Like Elijah flow. <laughs> Love to nine, you know, we bring that in. Elijah flow all in perspective because Elijah was bringing that whirlwinds of fire. Yeah, we're talking Sodom and Amor flow on account an account related in the Chronicle of Otto, Bishop of Friesland, 1145, appears to allude to a passage in the book of Revelation that tells of the drying of the Euphrates River to open, quote, the way of the kings of the east. The Chronicle states that Preston John was attempting to make his way to rescue Jerusalem. Man. Each kingdom was associated with a lens or mirror that allowed the king and other users to seek everything to see clearly that dragon that was happening throughout the realm so could he see all across the earth plain the idea of a sacred talismanic stone talismanic stone the shintamani and shibola or shambhala so they have their magic right they got their necromancy and the Kramakan, but we got our own stones and our own sacred magic but we have to be in order with it. We can't be worshiping and conjuring up no other energies. You know what I'm saying? Only Hawa. And when you do, you got the power of the elements. You got the power of these stones. You got the power of this frequency called Shintamani. And the Holy Grail or Presta, Stone of Parsifal, back to the romances. Another legend states that among the gifts sent by Preston John to the Holy Roman Emperor included the Philosopher's Stone. So among the gifts sent by the Presta is what's called the Philosopher's Stone and they got something called the Philosopher's Venom and all this connects to the dragon and Tibetan Mongolian tradition, Shambhala, is associated with subterranean tunnels and caves. In the letter of Preston John, there is an interesting comment for comparison. Again, we're talking about subterranean. Almost like those giant trees have roots that stay rooted, even though they get sliced in half, or we got mesas and flat top mountains like Mount Roraima. We're gonna come in hot with some Mount Roraima flow. And Preston 97, let's go. Well, now we're talking about these roots that form the subterranean tunnels. The roots of the trees form the caves. These are just tree roots. Near the wilderness trickles between barren mountains, a subterranean rill, which can only be, only by chance be reached. <laughs> For only occasionally the earth gapes. And who... And he who would descend must do it without precipitation ere the earth closes again. Wow. So you got the earth opening and the earth closing and you got to go up in it. <laughs> Each kingdom is described as fortunate islands in terms of natural abundance. So fortunate islands is not just one place. These are separate kingdoms called the fortunate islands. In terms of natural abundance, fertility, promised land, Shambhala is one of the Buddhist pure lands where people of good karma are reborn and live happily and virtuously. The kingdom of Prestatan is likewise blessed and contains nothing less than the original Garden of Eden. The people live virtuously, as stated in the king's letter, with us no one lies, for he who speaks a lie is thenceforth regarded as dead. He is more no more thought of or honored by us. No vice is tolerated by us. Both regions are known for their tame elephants. Another clue pointing towards the Indies, which is equally of interest. What is equally of interest is the fact that we first hear Preston John's kingdom in Europe about a century after the Kalakakra begins to spread to India and Tibet. And then you got these associations with these lands of pilgrimages and then some pilgrims come up you know before columbus man then some pilgrims come up man 
There's some pilgrims come popping off around here, man. Last time that I checked, it was some pilgrims popping up, man. <laughs> so, hey, you know, anywhere the making pilgrimage is might be a Cibola, Cibola, or a Shambhala, Shambhala. We'll leave this one for next time. This Andrew Toma, Shambhala Oasis of Light. You know what I mean? They got some more Shambhala drop. We got a lot of Shambhala drop. They got a whole drop uh, on page 99 called the Preston John's Kingdom, man. And you already know. I mean, they got so much Preston drop in here. They have to because this is just all about the kingdom of the Preston, man. And, you know, like I said, you know, none of us can make this stuff up. None of us saw this coming. You know, none of us was prepared <laughs> for what was happening. But, you know, this is what's happening. This is Preston John's kingdom, man. <laughs> Medieval maps show a mysterious country in Asia marked kingdom of Presper John. Geographically, it stretches from Turkestan to Tibet and from the Himalayas to the Gobi Desert. This land has surprising analogies with the realm of Harakas, Harakas, the holy ruler described by Philostratus in his life of Apollonius, Apollonius Tiana. And then it goes into the Presta flow, man. But, you know, look, <laughs> everyone's talking about the Presta. Everyone's talking about this magical, a mythical land. Eagle stones were able not only to improve one's power of vision, but could also render a man invisible if worn on a ring. So they put the eagle stone on a ring. Back to the fountain of youth. Probably the greatest attraction of the land was the fountain of eternal youth. When worthy men and women desired to be rejuvenated, all they had to do was fast and then take three troughs or drinks from the fountain. Immediately sickness and old age departed and they appeared to be 30 years old. And it's claimed that Preston John himself prolonged his life to a patriarchal age of 562 years. Then they got the eagle eye popping off. Magic stones could heat or freeze anything and illuminate the countryside for eight kilometers or five miles or else plunge the environment into complete darkness or ice, my naga. Maybe we're starting to see clearly the entrance to a shrine containing a magic stone was guarded by two aged men who admitted only virtuous people. A huge 13-story tower rose in the city of Preston John. There were no poor in Preston John's kingdom, and justice prevailed in his realm, nor did crime or vice exist there. My naga, we're talking that pure water. Everybody's looking for the grail, man. <laughs> Everyone's looking. They're looking through the romances. They're looking through the timelines. They're looking for paradise. In 1184, Troubadour and Knight Templar Wolfram von Etchenbach wrote his tutorial in which he summarized all the Holy Grail legends. He hinted at the link of the Holy Grail with Asia, which one, and described it as a stone. Was he speaking of Shambhala and the Shintamani stone? The Messinger's etching by claim that the Toro had lived for 500 years. This is a strange parallel with Preston John's life, which lasted 562 years at least, right? Actually, Etchenbach even connected the legend of the Holy Grail with the tale of Preston John. His Parsifal carried the sacred cup or the stone. So we're talking about a stone. Are we talking about a cup? We're talking about a magic stone and we're talking about a magical naga, man. Hey, man, this is the Presta Hour, <laughs> the 96th installment. And my naga, we still got that, that fire burning, man. And we still got that water flowing, man. And to water to all the tribe, you know, for all you've done and all you do to contribute to this recon, to this investigation, you know, we don't claim to know everything or do everything, 
you know, perfectly interpret this and that, but we steady water and we asking the right questions. And we might not have all the right answers, but we on investigation. So get out of our way while we investigate. It's okay for us to, you know, dig on it and see what it is and what it ain't. You know, you don't have to say, oh, y'all wrong. You know, oh, y'all think this and that, man. We, we don't think nothing, man. We, we are learning, you know, we are empty in our cup and we advise you to do the same thing. Cause that's the only way to keep the water flowing and to keep the fire burning. They think we in Asia, my noggin. <laughs> they looking around in, in Asia major and Asia minor. They searching for the Presta, then the goose. Hey, I got all the Prestas right here. Charmaine, Big Dizzle, what it do? Yeah, man, we steady flowing. You know, we got that water Dizzle over here popping off. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Excerpt begins with the firm refutation of Scalagos. This is America, man. Hey, shout out to the bro linked network sharing some of our drop, man, because we've been dropping that drop, man. That the Ethiopians were originally an Asian people. Why is he saying this, man? Which Asian? <laughs> Ethiopians are Asians. I think they're just trying to tell you that <laughs> you're in Asia. You're in Asia. And these Ethiopians, which is just a generic term, it's a Greek generic term for so called dark skinned people, wherever they are in the East, West, Orient, in between. Any area of black people, so called, is an Ethiopian. Wow. You're straight up. Tell them straight to your face that Ethiopia is Asia. Bang. That this is where they're looking for the press. And this is why the British Museum in the same area, you know, in this Asia, right? Because. Bang. <laughs> hey, it's all happening. It's all happening, man. <laughs> Big aqua ties on that on the big machines, man. Big aquas on the big machine. <laughs> aqua got a big heart, man. She said, Hey, I'll I'll lace it, you know, I'll lace these holes, man. You know, not with Naga lace, but with that pure energy, that pure vibration. Aqua tie does so much, man. And she even drills these holes, man. I just I just had to flash back to when it all first started, man. <laughs> Aqua Tai got the wheel. <laughs> Hezekiah, what it do? Clave. Oh, wow. <laughs> Let's go. Let's get it. T work. Make Nagaville work. Yeah. Go, Ty, go. Hey, man, that's big time on the ones and twos with the biggest heart. You know, say, hey, I'm taking the wheel. Big Hezekiah. Over there leading the way, man. Big Clay, I see you, man. And we do it for Nagaville. And you've been contributing. You know what I mean? Keep contributing. And let's pop off because all this recon is going right here in their face, bone, man. Right here in their face, bone, man. Royal Sons, you already know, man. Parish. He claims there are large mounds underwater that may have once been the site wow. of a lost city thousands of years ago. Paul Murphy reports local fishermen have long talked about strange and unexplained things happening in that area. Wow. The Chandelier Islands are a chain of uninhabited barrier islands located in the Gulf of Mexico, 50 miles east of New Orleans. But 12,000 years ago, before a dramatic sea level rise at the end of the last ice age. Whoa. Ice age. This area 
may have been dry land. Three different search areas. Retired architect and amateur archaeologist George Gillet believes the site now underwater was once home to an ancient civilization. Come on, man. Come on, man. Shout out to my Louisiana Nuggets, man. We see clearly, man, that it's all happening. And that they uh, are slowly having to, you know, discuss this freezing. You know, we over here discussing it. They got to discuss it because clearly it's all happening. And for that, we got to keep the water flowing. Continue to support Joy World. Family Chief stand still what it do. Marcus Rutley what it do. Excuse me, Maurice. Maurice (laughs) Rutley what it do. I got 14,305 rays so far going towards this long fence, this longest fence in Utah, Cedarwood, and we got a whole acre to cover, uh, more sheds to build, more things to do. So the water for checking in on the nugget. It's all happening, man. Um, you know, global warming is the end of an ice age. That's it. And they said he just popped off roughly 1300 to 1850. So during the mix of all this happening, these people were in ice freezing temperature. That's how much Hawa love you. <laughs> he made it hard for a hijack. They wanted to keep the fire burning, man. They needed to keep the fire burning, my nagi. But only you got that fire in you. Only you, you know, are the true, you know, copper color cons. That got that fire glowing. That can never be doused, can never be put out. The true copper color cons. They've been searching for you, man. They've been searching for the Preston. They've been searching for you, man. How long they've been searching? What does it say on this monument in South Africa, Preston John Memorial? How long they've been searching, man? Oh, there we go. In memory of those seafarers who searched for Preston John for 500 years looking for one man, right? 1145 to 1645. (laughs) Or is 1145. 1645. <laughs> Love to the Templar, man. We keeping the fire burning. We keeping the water flowing, man. And remember, Hawa made the covenant with Dawi. So you are supposed to be searching, seeking. All your generations are established. Your seed is established because Hawa's covenant has been sworn and protected forever. You will return. You will seek Hawa, your power, and David, your Khan. To come humble and tremble into the creator means you in code. And you are now back to your status as the head and not the tail, which is Hawa's goodness. In the end of days, allow Hawa for surfing a wave with the real ones, man. You know, this is certified, you know, digging on this in real time, searching for the Preston. Who is Preston John? This copper color Khan. Who is Khan David holding down <laughs> all barriers and destroying all hijacks? All praise our creator forever, my naga. Keep the fire burning and keep the water flowing and stay up. Hey, suit up. And whatever you do, (laughs) choose up. Oh, man, we got to keep the fire burning. (laughs) Hey, allow a while to the tribe. Look out for Preston John installment 97. The water for tuning in to installment number 96. Hey, this is the road to Preston John 100. Clear the way for a noggin. Continue to contribute. The water for your comments. Keep leaving them, and we'll keep reading them, man. The water to the tribe for making this the most exciting investigation hey, for our nation, you know, for at least the last 200 years, man. <laughs> we've been searching, we've been seeking. And Tarzanta, wow, 
we found the Holy Land connected to all three Indias. India one, India two, India three. <laughs> it's all happening. Hey, Shalom to the tribe. Stay up. Suit up. Choose up.